This afternoon, Professor Wilfred Sellers will present the first of four John Dewey lectures on the topic Naturalism and Ontology. There will be another lecture tomorrow at 4 o'clock, and the remaining two on Thursday and Friday of next week at the same time and in this room. <coughs> the Dewey Lectures have been given twice before at Columbia University, where John Dewey was a member of the philosophy department from 1904 until his retirement in 1930. For 10 years before that, Dewey was on the faculty of this university. In 1894, President Harper appointed him chairman of the Department of Philosophy, Psychology, and Education at the University of Chicago. Soon after that, he was joined here by George Herbert Mead, with whom Dewey had been associated at the University of Michigan. Dewey and Mead, together with Tufts, formed the Chicago School of Pragmatists. Richard McKeon, with whom I talked about this recently, told me that the Chicago School of Pragmatism was the only school of philosophy there has ever been at Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> Together with a group of sympathetic colleagues, Dewey published in 1903 a volume of the decennial publications of the University of Chicago, the famous Studies in Logical Theory. Shortly after Dewey arrived here, he helped found the famous laboratory school, which for a long time was commonly known simply as the Dewey School. It served as a laboratory for testing and developing his psychological and pedagogical theories. Some of Dewey's <coughs> earliest and most important books on education were published as lectures, were, were based on lectures delivered at the laboratory school. The School and Society, Chicago 1900, and The Child and the Curriculum, Chicago 1902. So it is entirely appropriate that a series of lectures in honor of John Dewey be given at our university. Our speaker, Wilfred Sellers, was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in 1912. He took his bachelor's degree at the University of Michigan, where his father, the distinguished philosopher Roy Wood Sellers taught throughout his academic career. Sellers received his master's degree from Buffalo, and from 1934 to 1937, he studied philosophy at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. He returned from England shortly before the war to take up academic positions at the University of Iowa, 1938 to 1946, University of Minnesota, 1947 to 1958, Yale University, 1958 to 1963. Since 1963, he has been at the University of Pittsburgh, where he is University Professor of Philosophy. In 1956, he lectured at the University of London, and in 1965, 1966, he gave the John Locke Lectures at Oxford. He has just been named Karras Lecturer by the American Philosophical Association. These well-deserved honors have come to him through the influence of his many articles and three books, Science, Perception, and Reality, 1963, Philosophical Perspectives, 1967, and Science and Metaphysics, Reflections on Kantian Themes, 1968, which embody the John Locke Lectures delivered at Oxford. In addition, he is editor of the important journal Philosophical Studies, co-editor with Herbert Feigl of the influential collection of readings in philosophical analysis, with John Hosper's Readings in Ethical Theory. Both of these books have recently been reissued in greatly revised second editions. He is without question one of America's leading philosophers. I am honored to present him to you today. Wilfred Sellers.
When I was coming to philosophical consciousness, the great battles between the systems, which began in the 20th century, were, was drawing, were drawing to a close, although the lightning and the thunder were still impressive. I cut my teeth on issues dividing idealists and realists and the various schools of realism. I learned about them at my father's knee, and perhaps for that reason, never got into pragmatism. My father regarded it as shifty, ambiguous, and indecisive. You remember Lovejoy's 13 varieties of pragmatism. Well, he thought that there was a continuum of pragmatism. <laughs> Time is unreal, sense data are parts of physical objects, mind is a distinct substance from the body, uh, we intuit essences, there is something you can get your teeth into. Pragmatism seemed all method and no results. I spent my early years fighting in the wars against positivism, the last of the great metaphysical systems. All was a realist, flirting with Oxford Aristotelianism, Aristotelianism Platonism, <coughs> intuitionism, but somehow convinced at the back of my mind that something like critical realism and evolutionary naturalism must be true. It wasn't until I began to think my own thoughts that I ran across Dewey and began to read him. It wasn't easy going, certainly lacking the deceptive clarity of the British empiricists, but certainly not as opaque as Hegel. <laughs> he caught me at a time when I was moving away from the myth of the given. And uh, those of you who are aware of the stress I lay on the mythical character of the given must understand surely that I must have been addicted to, to this myth in order to react so violently against it, and that would indeed be true. That would indeed be true. So I was, that was a revolution against an earlier point of view of, of uh, my own. I'm tempted to associate the phrase the myth of the given with Dewey's, what Dewey called the myth of antecedent reality. I suspect there is some connection there. And I was also rediscovering the coherence theory of meaning. It was Dewey's idealistic background which intrigued me the most. I found similar themes in Royce and later Peirce. I was astonished at what I had missed. Although I consider myself a scientific realist, Dewey's world of experience is very much akin to what I call the manifest image of man in the world, which is really the gateway, as I see it, to scientific realism. One of my father's early papers was called Whose experience? He implied that the answer had to be your experience or my experience. But Dewey, of course, would have replied, our experience. For intersubjectivity and community were at the center of his thought as they are of mine. As far as naturalism is concerned, uh, that too had negative overtones at home. It was wishy-washy and ambiguous. One could believe almost anything about the world, and even some things about God, and be a naturalist. What was needed was a new materialism, a new non-reductive materialism. My father could call himself a materialist in all good conscience, for at that time he was the only one, or about the only one. I, however, do not have, uh, do not own the term, and I am so surprised by some of the views of the new new materialists that until the dust settles, I prefer the term naturalism, which combines, uh, which while retaining its methodological connections, uh, has acquired a substantive content, which if it is not, does not entail scientific realism, is at least not incompatible with it. First lecture is called In Praise of Something. Quote something. Ontology is the theory of what there is. To understand what ontology is, therefore, we must understand the phrase, what there is, which points to the question, what is there? Obviously, if someone were asked this question out of the blue, he would not know what to make of it, unless he were a philosopher. For philosophers carry around with them a context or ambience 
in which otherwise startling questions are relevant and at home. In this case, however, even if we are in a philosophical mood, we cannot help but be puzzled by this question if we linger on it for a moment and don't rush on to specific issues in ontology. At this point, I might discuss the grammar of what questions in general or call attention to the fact that in ordinary contexts, we would feel the question to be incomplete expecting some such continuation as, what is there which has 12 pairs of legs in each chicken? In, instead, I will make the obvious point that when the uh, ontologist who asks this question, if he ever does, uh, he is concerned with kinds. As is so often the case, a grammatical, a grammatical singular at the surface carries uh, uh, conceals plurality in the depths. On the other hand, a paraphrase of the, uh, of the question, of the initial question as what kinds of thing are there would and should be met with resistance. Thus, an ontologist might well object that his concern is not with what kinds of thing there are, for this admits as answers names of kinds, thus lion kind, dragon kind, and although there might be, these might be of interest to him as a zoologist or mythologist, and on occasion even as a logician or philosopher, when as an ontologist he asks what is there, he is not looking for empty kinds, which is not to say that the kind empty kind, which is by no means empty, might not be of great interest. From his point of view then, a more adequate paraphrase would be, what kinds are there such that there are things of that kind? Yet although this account has the virtue of leading eventually to such cases as there are lions, there are tame tigers, there are no dragons, it obviously begins at a high level of abstraction. As a matter of fact, it strikes us that our original question might as well have been, what are there? To which there are lions seems to be the direct answer. And if this answer is brushed aside by someone who asks, who cares, quaeontologist, if there are lions, or for that matter, dragons, the following answers might well be forthcoming. There are numbers, there are classes, there are attributes, there are propositions, there are possible worlds, and so on. Or there are classes and classes of classes, but yes, there are no attributes. At this point, I might turn my attention to the classical distinction between ordinary kinds and categories. But instead of addressing myself directly to this topic, I prefer to have it take its own time in emerging in the course of these lectures. Yet today I do want to plunge directly into ontological issues. Or to change metaphors, the ontological um, dialogue, uh, uh, plunge into the ontological dialogue which swirls around us with all the familiar twists and turns. It is my purpose to join the argument, but cagely to choose my moments in such a way as to display my views to their best advantage. I shall assume to start with, then, that, to make, that the way to make a direct ontological commitment to numbers is to say, in all candor, there are numbers. If I were to add, quote, or something which can reasonably be, par be said to entail the statement, end quote, I would, of course, and have opened Pandora's box, and we are not yet quite ready for that. Thus, I focus attention to begin with on the form there are k's, where k represents a sortal or count noun. I shall also uh, assume that to use an example, there are lions can be paraphrased as something is a lion. I shall not, however, draw upon the paraphrase lions exist, not because it doesn't, at least in some contexts, serve this purpose, but because the verb to exist is a slippery one and has uses which belong in quite different contexts and raise quite different problems. My general strategy will be to draw attention, draw a distinction between a sense of philosophically interesting questions of the form there are k's, for example, there are attributes, to which the appropriate answer is, so to speak, a truistic yes. Of course there are attributes. Of course there are qualities. Of course there are relations and a sense in which the answer, whether yes or no, is highly con controversial. This second sense can be phrased in traditional philosophical style, are there really attributes? Though 
just what the burden of really is part of the longer story. You may be put in mind of Carnap's distinction between internal and external questions, but this is not what I have in mind, although it is not unrelated, and I shall have something to say about that distinction at a later stage in the argument. I've implied that it is, in a sense, a truism to say that there are classes, attributes, numbers, propositions, possibilities, etc. What is not truistic is, in the spirit of G.E. Moore, the analysis of these truisms. Thus, are attributes analyzable into or reducible to items belonging to another and presumably non-abstract kind, or to use a more uh, contemporary turn of phrase, are statements about attributes paraphrasable in a philosophically interesting way in terms of statements about non-abstract entities? Can we regiment discourse about attributes without losing our ability to say what we want to say, to say what will serve our purposes. Only as a last resort would I consent to expunge discourse about attributes from my vocabulary. It may turn out to have more shorthand cousins, more shorthand cousins who can do all the work it really does, but appearances are what give point to life, even for the philosopher. And I know that even that lover of desert landscapes, Klein, enjoys them all the more because of his geographer's knowledge of the jungle. <laughs> to return to the main thread, it will be useful to make a terminological commitment and so use the term object and classify that such a statement as Tom is a man will be said to refer to an object and classify it as a man. I remind you that I am focusing attention on the form x is a k. I might have used the more general form x is phi, where phi can represent either a sortal or an adjectival predicate, or even phi x, where phi can even represent a verb. But the varieties of predication, or what is called predication, and the varieties of use given to the complex, to the copula, are so manifold that it will be good strategy to cut them down to size uh, where, the, where it promises even temporary advantage. Notice that by stipulating a use for object, I make it possible to reserve entity for a different, if related, role. How then are we to understand something is a lion? Clearly it doesn't refer to uh, a selected object, yet it has something to do with objects. If we reflect that the statement in question is true, if and only if some object or other is a lion, we may be tempted to say that in the context, in this context, something makes an indefinite or indeterminate reference to objects. Uh, well, not in the way everything is a lion does, yet in its own way, it doesn't leave any out to all objects. Well, not in the way everything is a lion does, yet in its own way, it doesn't leave any out. If asked to explain this indeterminate reference to all objects, there are two general lines we might take. The first of which divides into two, each of which points hopefully to the other. A, the general line of the first strategy is to argue that the referential character of something is derivative from the referential character of determinate references, say names and demonstratives. Now, to this general strategy A, there's a first form, A1. The first and rather forlorn substrategy is to equate something as a lion with Leo is a lion, or Nixon is a lion, or Goldwater is a lion, or Gibraltar is a lion, perhaps the number three is a lion, or etc. This line, though not without its temptations, runs into familiar roadblocks. The etc. is doing an awful lot of unexplained work. Uh, as Miss Hanscom points out, the etc., or dots which might replace it, is not the etc. of laziness. Yet when we reflect on the different ways in which something and everything refer indeterminately to all objects, we are bound to feel that or 
and and have something to do with the distinction. The second, A2, and more lively substrategy under A, returns to the theme of the truth conditions for something is a lion. You remember uh, that something is a lion roughly is true if and only if uh, some object or other is a lion. But now, uh, return, we interpret it rather along uh, a familiar line. Something is a lion is true if and only if some statement which makes a determinate reference to an object and classifies it as a lion is true. I formulate it in this way to stress its attempt to explain indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. This substrategy has the advantage of not pretending that we can actually come up with a list of determinate references which would be necessary to yield something in some sense equivalent to the original statement, let alone synonymous with it. But while the second form of the first strategy has this advantage, it has troubles of its own. Statements are made in a language, and the resources of any natural language are always limited, certainly with respect to determinate referring expressions. Thus, A2 cannot con uh, construe the force of some statement which makes a determinate reference to an object in terms of a specified list of expressions um, in, um, in actual usage. Thus, it, is not, it must rely on the fact that a language is not what it is at any one time, not even what is, uh, its resources are not even what is available, no, not actually used at a time, but in a sense difficult to define the resources which the language could be extended and uh, by which the language could be extended in specific ways. It is this notion of the extendability of a language which makes it possible for the second substrategy under A for explaining indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference uh, possible. Of course, there is a more seriously serious difficulty uh, which arises when we uh, consider the fact that the domain of objects uh, includes real numbers, for example. It is, however, uh, it is presumably axiomatic that all extensions of a language contain at most a denumerable infinity of determinate referring expressions. An assessment of this difficulty must await an explanation of the sense in which numbers are objects. But what is the alternative? You see, the first alternative is to make some attempt to explain the reference of something. In other words, indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. What's the alternative? It is, to my mind, a most puzzling one. Though its puzzling aspects are quietly passed over, indeed, I would say, swept under the rug by those who espouse it. For it amounts to nothing more nor less than the idea that the word something has a connection unmediated by determinate references with all objects. And uh, by connection, as will become evident, I mean a relationship in psycholinguistic terms. I've been discussing the issue in terms of the word something but its bite remains when we transpose it into the language of the logicians. Thus, where something is a tiger and it is tame becomes uh, EX, X is a tiger and X is tame. I read it simply that way because uh, the readings are, of course, as I see it, uh, the source of philosophical puzzles here. EX, X is a tiger and X is tame. The variable x is said to range over objects, but it is not clear what it is for a variable to range over objects. Is there a word-world connection between variables and items in extralinguistic realm of lions and tigers? If so, and the answer must surely be yes, is this ranging 
which is clearly the counterpart of the indeterminate reference of something, to be explicated in terms of determinate reference, or is it to be taken as a basic mode of reference? Now, I have no objection whatever to a logician treating the concept of indeterminate reference as an unanalyzed concept in logical theory. <coughs> But its explication confronts the philosophical logician as a challenge, which should not be ignored and will not go away. In formal semantics, one may, in a sense, explain the indeterminate reference of a statement, for example, EX, X is a lion, in the object language, of which one is giving the semantics, as one says, by giving its truth conditions in an appropriate meta-language. For example, EX, quote, EX, X is a lion, end quote, in language L, and is true if and only if EX, X satisfies, single quote, X is a lion, close single quote, in L. Or to capture certain formal problems, EX, X is a series, and the series satisfies, single quote, X is a lion, close single quote, in L. Where we now consider infinite series of objects. But it leaps to the eyes that the problem of the nature of indeterminate reference has simply been transferred to the meta-language. I don't say that this isn't where it belongs. Indeed, strategy A2 made a parallel move. But when it gave the truth conditions of something as a line in the meta-language, it did so with reference to statements of determinate reference in the object language and did not simply repeat indeterminate reference. It at least attempted to come to grips with the problem. The above, quote, explication, end quote, of indeterminate reference in terms of truth conditions simply postpones it. Even if one restricts the range of something to individuals in space and time, the puzzle is acute. It becomes particularly obtrusive when the claim is made that the referential character of proper names can be regimented as the referential character of descriptive phrases, the latter being traced in turn to the referential character of something, as when Plato is construed as, quote, the student of Socrates and teacher of Aristotle, end quote. And this in turn is construed in context in terms of something is uniquely a student of Socrates and teacher of Aristotle. Uh, for, for example, when Nixon is, quote, Nixon is construed as the Nixonizer, and this in turn is construed in connection with particular contexts in terms of something uniquely Nixonizes. <laughs> as I have already indicated, it seems obvious to me that expressions with successful determinate reference are connected with the extralinguistic world. Thus, Plato with a Greek philosopher, and, quote, Nixon with that man in the White House. On the view we are considering, this connection is to be interpreted, on the view we are considering, remember, you might say the orthodox view, uh, this connection is to be interpreted as a focusing of the connection between something and objects in general on a particular object by means of one or more predicates which pick out the term, which pick it out. Uh, for example, a predicate student of Socrates, teacher of Aristotle. Determinate reference is the focusing of indeterminate reference. Quine tells us that variables of quantification are the bearers of reference. In traditional terms, something, the word something, is the bearer of reference. I am simply asking that this be taken seriously and an account given of how variables of quantification, of how the word something hooks up with the world. Remember that I am not objecting to the concept of determinate, uh, the, the concept of indeterminate reference. Indeterminate reference cannot be avoided, except perhaps by God who has a name for the sparrow which falls. The problem is how the concept of such reference is to be explicated. Neither of the strategies we have considered dispenses with quantification. For both, 
the word sum is used in the explication of, indeterminate re of the indeterminate reference of something in something is a lion. In the first strategy, it appears in some statement, which makes a determinate reference to an object and classifies it as a lion is true. In the second, it appears in uh, EX, X satisfies single quote X is a lion, and X is a lion, quote X is a lion is true of X, which uh, corresponds to something satisfies quote X is a lion, and quote, or X is a quote X is a lion, close quote, is true of something. So the, the concept of sum and the notion of something is indispensable, but it, as I said, it's, the challenge is to explain its connection with extra-linguistic reality. Now, some philosophers have tended to overlook this problem because in dealing with formalized languages, the resources of which are recursively specified by an effective procedure, they use a concept of reference which is not that of a connection between expressions and items in the world, though it is, in an interesting sense, parasitical upon it. They use a concept which is defined in purely logical terms. Thus, X refers to Y, all hyphenated, in a certain language, equals by definition. X equals, quote, New York in L, and Y equals New York, or X equals, quote, Chicago in L, and Y equals Chicago, or X equals, quote, Nixon in L, and Y equals Nixon, or, 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 or. Such a defined notion, as I pointed out in my paper for the Carnap volume some 20 years ago, is useful in constructing a recursive account of the semantical properties of the expressions of a formalized language. But they no more explicate the concept of reference than X is the Dutch uncle of Y equals by definition, X equals Mr. Jones and Y equals Tom, or X equals Mr. Smith and Y equals Dick, or X equals Mr. Roberts and Y equals Harry, explicates what it is to be a Dutch uncle. The puzzle of indeterminate reference becomes truly formidable when the concept of reference is extended to abstract objects, thus attributes, classes, classes of classes, numbers, propositions, etc. How one wants to know, does the word something connect up with them? Here, however, the tension is heightened by the fact that even the concept of determinate reference to an abstract entity is problematic. Thus, in the case of non-abstract objects, there is at least the hope of explaining indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. But in the case of abstract objects construed in the classical manner as non-reducible to non-abstract objects, how is determinate reference to be understood? Surely if, as is surely the case, the English word triangularity refers to the abstract object triangularity, there must be a psycholinguistic connection between the word and the object. Notice that it won't do to grant the general point that the word triangularity has a psycholinguistic connection with something, but argue that it is with triangular things. For triangularity is neither constituted by nor identical with any collection of triangular things and could be uh, referred to as readily if there were no triangular things. The classical Platonist was perfectly content to speak of real relations between forms and persons. He was willing to use the language of vision and of intercourse. He was, uh, Plato's forms made themselves known to us by acting on our minds. And if the concept of a cause which does not change in the course of causing is a puzzling one, at least uh, it was a serious, it represents a serious attempt to deal with a serious problem. In Neoplatonism, this causation became the agency of God. But the concept of the illumination of the mind was essentially the, essentially the same. Platonists believed themselves aware of experiencing the forms, but they also thought that their influence, whether we were aware of it or not, was necessary to explain how we could think of the world as we do 
and how we could know mathematical, ethical, and metaphysical truths. Many philosophers who have an ontology, which includes irreducible abstract objects, have felt uncomfortable about the idea of a causal relation between these objects and persons. They have contented themselves with the term awareness. We are aware of universals. We are aware of classes. We are aware of classes of classes of attributes and the rest. Uh, whether awareness is considered as an act, as a relation, or a tie, it is a connection in the spirit of our challenge. I suspect, however, that when metaphors and mysteries in which the concept of awareness are shrouded are spelled out, something like the platonic theme of causal efficacy will be found at the core. After all, traditional concepts of awareness, at least as recently as Moore, were based on the analogy of vision. And can vision be understood without causality? Now, many contemporary, uh, many contemporary Platonists and philosoph Platonic philosophers of mathematics are uh, aware of uh, the, this implication that is necessary, uh, as I see it, to deal with the problem of the uh, reference of uh, names of abstract singular terms to abstract entities. Uh, now, for example, uh, the, the classical theme here is uh, in, to be found in, uh, uh, in Diogenes of Sinope, uh, uh, reported by Diogenes Laertius, uh, who is said to have, to have reacted to such notions as seeing and being aware of and having intercourse with real being with the scoffing remark, table and cup I see, but your tablehood and cuphood, Plato, I nowhere see. That's readily accounted for, said Plato, for you have the eyes to see the visible table and cup, but not the understanding by which ideal tablehood and cuphood are discerned. And a recent formulation of the Platonic thesis, which is the more valuable, and it is taken from a paper by one of the central figures in the current controversy over abstract entities, is as explicit as one could wish. And this is a quote from Alonzo Church. The extreme demand for a simple prohibition of abstract entities under all circumstances perhaps arises from a desire to maintain the connection between theory and observation. But the preference of, say, seeing over understanding as a method of observation seems to me capricious. For just as an opaque a body may be seen, so a concept may be understood or grasped. And the parallel between the two cases in, is indeed rather close. In both cases, the observation is not direct, but through intermediaries. Light, lenses of eye, or optical instruments in the one case, in the retina, and linguistic expressions in the case of the concept. Now there, Alonzo Church recognizes that if one is seriously going to put on abstract entities in one's ontology, one does need to have something like a psycholinguistic connection between language and these objects. Now in my essay in the Carnap volume, uh, referred to above, I made the point that a semantical theory which finds a genuine place for abstract entities would have to recognize psycholinguistic relationships between these entities and persons. Carnap denied this, of course. But his denial simply mobilized the theme that in the case of abstract entities, for example, numbers, x designates in g y equals, by definition, x equals uh, eins, the German word eins, and y equals one. Or x equals the German word psi, and y equals the number two etc., etc., or, 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 or. But as in the case of non-abstract objects, such a concept of designates in L, defined by a listing, no more explicates the connection between number words and numbers as classically conceived as non-linguistic objects than it, than it explains the connection between the word, quote, Chicago and the Windy City. Philosophers have a peculiar <clears throat> form of the Midas touch. Everything they touch becomes a puzzle, <laughs> and eventually a problem. 
The concept of reference, and particularly of indeterminate reference, is certainly no exception. I have touched it, and speaking for myself, at least, have encountered the problem of how language and objects are related. I began by assuming that in the case of ordinary objects, at least determinate reference involves a real relation between these objects and the expressions which refer to them. I did not mean to imply that there is nothing problematic about this connection. Uh, indeed, it has long been my con conviction that it is one of the key problems of philosophy. And in some of my writings, I have attempted to show that, not, that only a thoroughly naturalistic philosophy of mind can solve it. One of my purposes in these lectures is to clarify and expand these attempts and to make, more make them more persuasive than they have proved to be. In addition to touching on the problem of indeterminate reference, which, though surely central to contemporary discussions of ontological issues, uh, which, though surely central to contemporary discussions of ontological issues, remains behind the scenes and needs to be smoked out, I've also touched on the topic of determinate reference to abstract objects, though I've pursued it just far enough to introduce you to my perplexities. Sooner or later, I shall return, of course, to the topic of abstract entities and how we refer to them. But before I do so, I wish to call attention once more to the versatility of the word something. As I, the lecture is entitled, In Praise of Something, and I have just begun to justify this name. <clears throat> I shall introduce the next point without, elaborate, without the elaborate dialectic with which I introduced it and defended it some 17 years ago when I was also writing an essay on ontology. It's called Grammar and Existence, uh, Preface to Ontology. It is to the effect that in ordinary language, we can not only generalize from Tom is tall to something is tall, but also from Jones is pale and Smith is also pale to Jones is something and Smith is also it. And from Jones is a professor and Smith is also a professor to Jones is a something and Smith is also an it. And even though I shall not argue the point from if Jones comes, then there will be trouble, to if something, then there will be trouble. Thus, something can be used in contexts in which it replaces an adjective, context in which it replaces a sortal, and context in which it replaces a sentence. As I said, I'm giving this sort of boldly here because uh, um, it uh, otherwise would uh, require some nice examples of dialogues in ordinary language and of course we want to get right down to the analytic heart of it. Thus, uh, uh, it will be useful for our purposes to use a terminology in which the word corresponding to something contains an indication of the grammatical category of the determinate expressions it replaces. By the way, the scholastics were very well aware of the, uh, the unique and, uh, um, uh, and wide-ranging role of aliquid. Uh, I mean, you could, we could, uh, the history of logic is, is full of perceptions on the topic that I am discussing today. The role of something that I've been talking about uh, uh, is a topic which, uh, uh, as I said, has a venerable history, and rightly so. Now, I'm going to introduce a terminology, as I said, in which I'm going to use a special variations on the word something. Thus, instead of Jones is something and Smith is also it, I will write Jones is somehow and Smith is also it, or Jones is somehow and Smith is that how. Strictly speaking, this is a bad choice because how is Jones would not normally be answered by Jones is pale or let alone Jones is tall. But I can think of nothing better unless we go, as I once did, uh, to the Latinate sum quale, 
Jones's sum quale. Correspondingly, I shall use Jones is a sum sort as the generalization from Jones is a philosopher. And following a suggestion stemming from Arthur Pryor, uh, if sum that, there will be trouble. Now the points I am about to raise and discuss have been put to use by philosophers of language influenced by Frege, particularly Peter Geech and more recently Michael Dummett in his monumental study of Frege. Now after introducing these contrived uh, counterparts of something in the contexts uh, which I, with which I am concerned, I shall leave them in the background until the real philosophizing is to be done. Thus, I shall move immediately to a mode of representation by symbols. Thus, for Jones is somehow, and Smith is that how, I shall use EF, Jones is F, and Smith is also F. This is, this is uh, going to be our symbolese for our contrived, somewhat contrived uh, sentence. Jones is somehow, and Smith is that how. Now there is no surface reason to think that the first of these ways of speaking, Jones is hum somehow, and Smith is that how, makes an explicit ontological commitment. Uh, though it can be paraphrased as Jones is something and Smith is also it. For it does not have the form something is a K or there are Ks which we have taken to be our paradigm of ontological commitment. And if we put it as Jones is somehow and Smith is that how, we must be careful not to split up somehow we have Jones is somehow and Smith is also that how we must be very careful not to split up somehow into some how uh, this will this has will have a little sting to it which will appear uh, in my next lecture. Uh, nor should we separate that how into that how. For this might, uh, might lead us to construe how as a sort of. Jones is some how. And move from Jones is some how and Smith is that how to there is a how such that Jones is it and Smith is it, and from there to there are hows. <laughs> An ontological commitment to hows. Perhaps further argument will lead us to the idea that there are hows, or something like hows, but we should uh, not beg the question to begin with. I mean, I, I think the idea that there are hows is a pleasant one. <laughs> uh, but uh, we may, in the last analysis, uh, have to withdraw our compliments from them. I should equally have warned against reading something as something. For this leads to the temptation to construe the X in EX, X is a tiger as though it were the sort of thing or object. And to read the formalism, there is an object and uh, such that it is a tiger. If now we look at the symbolic representation, EF, Jones is F, and Smith is also F, we might be tempted to think of the F as a restricted variable. Thus, instead of representing, and I'll give you an example of a restricted variable, instead of representing some cows, some crows are black as EX, X is a crow and X is black, we might, if we had a simple-minded interest in crows, 
uh, really a single-minded interest in crows, use the variable small c and simply say, E C, C is black. Or in the case of numbers, if we have a single-minded interest in numbers, we might, instead of saying E X, X is a number and X is divisible by three, we might say E N, N is divisible by three. Thus, somebody who approaches this from that direction and uh, with certain other, uh, what shall I say, bees buzzing around in his bonnet, might think that EF, F Jones is F, is a restricted form of EX. X is an attribute and Jones has X, which would, on our assumptions, correspond to there is an attribute such that Jones has it, which makes explicit ontological reference commitment to attributes. Notice that I am assuming that attributes are had or exemplified by objects. If so, we have a direct conflict between the logical form of the unquantified statement with which we began, namely Jones is pale, and that of its quantified counterpart thus interpreted, thus manhandled, there is an attribute such that Jones has it. There is, of course, another reason why one might think of the symbolic representation, if taken seriously, uh, attributes must be introduced as objects which things have are involved. Thus, it might be argued that if we took the quantification seriously, we are led to the following truth condition. EF is Jones, we're thinking of a truth condition for that, and we might be led to the following. Remember, this is Jones is somehow, a generalization from Jones is pale. Quote, EF, Jones is F, and quote in English is true if and only if, for some X, X is an attribute, and quote, Tom has Y, close single quote, is true of X. But though this biconditional is indeed true, it is not because a truth condition for this must be given in these terms, but simply because for every statement of the form Jones is F, there is a corresponding statement logically equivalent to it, but not synonymous with it, Jones has Fness. Thus, Jones is somehow, although logically equivalent to, there is an attribute which Jones has is not synonymous with it. And this situation arises often in logic. We have, for example, snow is white, that snow is white is true. Now, this is logically equivalent to that snow, to that snow is, to the snow is white, but it doesn't mean the same as it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it will turn out that the reason why these are logically equivalent and, but not synonymous, turn to be the same, because it turns out that the concept of truth does come in to the concept of an attribute. Now, uh, I want to uh, wind up uh, the discussion for today, laying the groundwork for what I want to discuss uh, tomorrow. And indeed, to a Phrygian, this argument about truth conditions begs the question by assuming that truth conditions must be given in terms of objects. One can indeed be exclusively interested in interpretations of sentences in which quantifiers range over objects. And indeed, so use the phrase truth on an interpretation so that, that quantifiers must be interpreted as ranging over objects. But it is at least at first sight open to someone to distinguish between truth on an interpretation and truth period. We have already appealed to Carnap's principle of toleration a more recent form of Joseph's, H.W.B. Joseph's, plea for free thinking in logistics, a famous uh, series of articles in mind. And uh, we have demanded the right to use the full symbolic apparatus of quantification in connection with predicate variables. Uh, without assuming that either by explication or by considerations pertaining to truth conditions, we are led directly to an ontological commitment to attributes as objects which ordinary objects have. Now, uh, I think I'll stop there today because next time I want to discuss, begin to discuss the Freakian alternative, the notion, uh, putting it humorously, as I said, it's going to be the notion that there are hows. And I'm going to try to discuss how one gets to the idea that there are hows 
and whether one has to agree that there are hows, and uh, what are we to do in get in place of hows. And uh, that is the menu. Well, we could stop for a few minutes if, for people who want to leave. Uh, Professor Sellers will conduct the discussion period following this in a few minutes. Yes. You uh, care to comment on Klein's manner of dodging the problem you put up for him, uh, which is that a uh, philosophical logician really ought to ought not to leave the. Uh, referential character of, of uh, something unexplained, his manner of dodging it being, of course, to say, well, this is all subject to the indeterminacy of translation. Well, no, that, that, isn't, that doesn't avoid the question. That merely shows how complicated it is. I mean, this, this, brings, in, uh, this brings in the additional uh, uh, problem of, uh, of how one can determine uh, what the reference of a term is, uh, because ultimately, as you know, the problem comes home to the background language, and then the problem obviously can't be just solved by saying, well, one uses the background language because the philosophical problem remains, what is the connection between the background language and the world? So that there, there's the general problem of what I will call the representational character of language, which is one of the central themes in these lectures, representational character of language. And then there's the problem of determining um, what specifically the, ref the representational character of a given term is. And this is Quine's problem of translational indeterminacy. Now, uh, we can, as you know, we, we can, uh, we can uh, argue you know, uh, 40 days and 40 nights, uh, uh, and we all have. Uh, as to, A, what there really is to Quine's worries about translational indeterminacy. I mean, this is still, this is still, up, for, um, this is still up for grabs, uh, because, um, uh, as you know, the problem is, to what extent is there any more indeterminacy here than there is in uh, any, uh, any empirical theory? So uh, I would have to indicate, first of all, that, I'm, that I do not agree with Quine that there is the problem of translational indeterminacy. And then I could uh, indulge in sort of Quine exegetics and to see uh, what the relationship would be in his views between in translational indeterminacy and the problem of reference. But his problem is not my problem. My problem is the general problem of how does language hook up with the world, you see. And uh, his problem is, in what specific way is what hooking up with what? You might say his problem is a problem that works, it's a more specific problem which works within the general framework of my problem. So he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't seek to avoid the problem, he just doesn't deal with it. I was thinking that this uh, really amounts to a means of actually avoiding it. But, uh, the background language that mine is always regressing into, uh, taking your alternatives, uh, I would guess essentially A to do with the uh, I'm sorry, that's not right. But, 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 but he is, at any rate, explaining the existential quantification in the background language, which is, which is ordinary English. Yeah, but as I said. Uh, yeah, but the, well, I know, but still, uh, the, the question can still legitimately be raised about the background language. I mean, here, I mean uh, somebody once escaped Bradley's regress by saying, well, I stop here. <laughs> I wonder if you've got the board there. Jones is somehow dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Well, that suggests to me the incompleteness of the yeah, well, there I was. That, that was short for Jones is somehow and Smith is that how. I just, uh, I sort of, I put it, I read it, I mean, I, I spoke it as I did that, 
but uh, I didn't write it down. Now, I was thinking, you know, like Jones is somehow, to me, in those questions, somehow what? Yeah, I know. Jones is somehow he, an F. Right. Now, he I... Somehow normally comes in as an F. I know, and that's why I shouldn't have done that. And that was just, uh, that, those are the dots of laziness. <laughs> <laughs> So you're taking somehow by itself. Now. That's right. I'm, yes, I'm treating somehow uh, as um, uh, as a stand-in, you see, for uh, predicates like pale. Jones is pale, so Jones is somehow. It's uh, it's, if you will, the way in which we generalize from on the predicate side as opposed to generalizing on the subject side. So there really some folly going back. That's that. right. That's right. And. Uh, uh, so uh, I also had to remember that Jones is a professor, and Smith is also a professor. And I said, Jones is a some sort, and Smith is a that sort also. Now I'm going to be saying more about this uh, next time. I, I introduced them in order to raise the fascinating topic of hows which are going to, as you know, going to turn out to be Frege's concepts, which are not objects. And uh, uh, I will be indicating the patterns of argument which have been used to make this notion attractive. And uh, then I'll be suggesting an alternative. Yes? No, that if, if someone just said to you, but you make your ontological commitments by what you quantify over, to be is to be the value of the bound variable, uh, are you objecting that that's not sufficiently explicated or that it's just yeah. wrong? Well, what I'm saying is that, uh, that those who wish to so use uh, variables of quantification so that they are always to be interpreted as ranging over objects, that's legitimate. All, I, all I've done so far, of course you don't, in philosophy you don't, prove things, premise, 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 conclusion, and so on. But what I did was to appeal to a principle of tol toleration, so to speak. You know, uh, Carnap introduced the term. Uh, uh, one should be permitted to, to try things out, to see how, how far one can carry them. And certainly, somebody uh, who, uh, who uh, feels that, that, that there is a meaningful form of quantification or generalization which doesn't if so facto involve a reference to objects, uh, should be given a chance to try it out. And that's exactly what we find, you see, in the line of thought that I've been sketching here. That we can, just as we can go from Tom is tall to something is tall, so we can go from Tom is tall to Tom is something. We can generalize in both ways. Now, uh, the classical assumption has been by virtue of the way in which uh, quantification theory has been developed. Uh, you see, formally, that quantification always involves a range of objects for the variables. Now, the Fregian, of course, would want to say that uh, here we have a variable and a quantification, but it is not uh, uh, a variable which ranges over objects. Now, he, the Fregian is going to find a special kind of entity which it ranges over, which, he, which roughly are not objects. But then, uh, even apart from that, uh, there, are, uh, there are reasons to find it useful and uh, coherent to use the apparatus of quantification in connection with variables without interpreting it in such a way that the variable ranges over objects. Now, as I will indicate next time, there are two ways in which this can be done. One is the Frankian way of having it range over hows, and the other is by using substitutional quantification. So, uh, the issue, in, in a certain sense, the, the issue that you're all familiar with about objectual or, or substitutional quantification is lurking all around here. As a matter of fact, you'll remember the uh, first alternative, A2, which I gave, the, the, the second form of the first strategy was essentially the substitutional approach to the uh, uh, truth conditions for quantified statements. Only I carefully separate, I don't like to call it substitutional because that is a term from the theory of formal languages, and that involves the idea that you have a definite list of, of terms that you substitute and so on. You see, whereas I simply wanted to free it 
uh, and gives a more general philosophical point. Remember, the first alternative interpreted definite, in, indefinite reference in terms of definite reference by saying something is the lion is true if and only if some determinate reference to something, uh, uh, some sentence making a determinate reference uh, to something uh, and classifies that as a lion is true. Yes? Well, that means that in the long run, carrying this line out, if you took Tom is tall and got from that something is tall, mm -hmm. that something won't refer in the same sense to an object either. Uh, it's not that Tom is something won't and something is tall. But it, well, that is, uh, uh, I don't have a nice little formula to answer there, but I, I will say this, you're, you're warm. <laughs> you're warm because that is, again, the problem of the relation of, of something to the world. Uh, but, uh, again, there, there's no, I'm sure, I assure you, there's no simple way in which I can uh, unburden myself <laughs> on that. Yes? I don't know if this should be better asked tomorrow or today, but would you care to comment on the suggestion that Frege doesn't have variable ranging at all? In fact, they don't range, rather we have to have a higher level of predication. I, I will want to comment on that tomorrow, because I'm not, I'm not at this moment concerned actually with Frege himself, but with uh, variations on Fregean themes. This would be an alternative uh, post entirely different from That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. You were careful to distinguish between somehow is one word and somehow is two words. Mm -hmm. Would you also care to do it for that house? Yes. One word? Yeah. Or would you want to say something like that somehow? No. No, no. The, the, you see, a variable, the rule done in ordinary language, which is done by a variable, is that of cross reference, you might say. I mean, as Quine and standard logic say, the variable uh, comes out in, for example, for some x. Uh, X is a tiger and X is tame. You see, uh, the, the second X also is doing the job of it. In other words, referring back. Uh, uh, and so that job is done in ordinary language by words like uh, and it is or that is and so on. So the, that how is intended to refer back to the, uh, the <coughs> word somehow which governs the whole context. And is, in a way, it, it refers back to the somehow, grammatically, as the uh, as the second x does to the first x in the quantified formulation in the standard logistical notation. So it's not this one word. Okay. Yeah, that's how. Right. Yes. Well, I think we might. Oh yes. You've tied up uh, the word something for with the, the Latin word aliquid. Mm -hmm. You pointed out that ali, aliquid likewise is uh, arranges over everything in some respect, has some such universality. Mm -hmm. I, I want, was wondering just how uh, specific your reference to, to that aliquid was. That is, uh, you're aware that in Aquinas and others, aliquid is rendered as something like uh, an other thing, aliquid. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so it's supposed to bring out the idea of uh, of diversity in some way, mm -hmm. that is, an entity diverse from other entities. Right. Now, it wasn't clear to me whether uh, your reference to something likewise was intended to bring out that aspect of no, diversity. No, that would have been much more like the, I think, uh, aliquid is a word that was handled in different ways in different by different medieval logicians. And to handle it in that way, see, there are two themes that come in. <coughs> One is its trans-category character. And that's the theme I've been stressing with the something and somehow here. And the other, the other theme is, uh, the, is the theme of reference. And there is exactly where one has that temptation to break it up into uh, some thing as opposed to another thing. You see. And so, see, I would then be uh, expressing a slight anxiety when Aquinas uh, makes that particular move, which I don't think he needed to make and I don't think needs to be made in order to stress uh, the character of aliquid as a transcendental. Yeah. So you wouldn't be going along with his use of the 
word race, R-E-S, as another right. transcendental, which seems to have an objectual right. uh, aspect. Right. Right. But I think this, this is a fascinating topic. I simply uh, threw it in because it, uh, the medieval logicians did have this, and the air, going back to Aristotle, you can trace it there, did have this concept of the transcendental, some, some way of, uh, uh, some mode of, shall we say, reference in some very broad sense, which transcends the distinction between the categories. And in, this term, in these terms here, that means that it plays different grammatical roles. And then we want to examine what, this, what the significance of these different grammatical roles is for problems of reference, and problems of the relation of language to the world, which is the basic problem, which I want to discuss in these lectures. How does language, and of course, ultimately thought, uh, connect up with the world? Well, I think that will, uh, I think my, what's that? Mr. I'm sure that this question will uh, be relevant, uh, doubly relevant next time. Maybe answer. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can answer. Hey, Pat? Oh, well, no. Oh, right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm delighted that uh, oh, there are these well. You do give him my wonderful regard. Yes. Uh, yes, he wrote a master's degree with me. Here is the mirror. Minnesota. Minnesota. That's right. So, yeah. oh, I know. It's Very cold place. I've never been quite there. Uh, yeah. 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 I wanted to say something controversial. You know where the solarium is? No, it's that big separate one. That's where the reception is. Well, well, I just said I wanted to say something controversial. Leonard wasn't, didn't go through. That was because he was 
They just renovated this, the old library. Well, this was a lecture hall when I first came. It was M11. Oh. Oh. Uh, this is where we used to lecture. It used to be a flat floor, and the chairs used to be. Uh, This, this is the second lecture of the second John Dewey lecture series. In presenting our speaker, Wilfred Sellers, yesterday, Leonard Linsky explained the background of the John Dewey lectures and of John Dewey and the career of Wilfred Sellers. And Sellers began his lecture by recalling his distaste for pragmatism and his first encounter with the philosophy of Dewey. He had learned about pragmatism as a no noisome, vague fen from Roy Wood Sellers. But when he began reading Dewey, he found in Dewey's distrust with the showcase theory of truth in which truths are presented for the inquiring mind to perceive, a position that was sympathetic and congenial with his own distrace, distrust of the myth of the given. <clears throat> My function in presenting the second lecture is simply to take you to this fork of the road which we had reached in the first lecture and to look a little further along the road. After John Dewey left the University of Chicago and went to Columbia, he wandered around the world and came back from China and Japan with a manuscript of the lectures that he gave to explain Western philosophy to the Eastern mind. The book was called Reconstruction in Philosophy. To present philosophy is to reconstruct it. And thereafter, he proceeded to make a series of journeys from experience to nature, experience to art, from human nature to conduct. Sellers has already told us that his distrust of the myth of the given leads to different problems than those that were raised by Dewey's distaste for pre-existent knowledge. And therefore, different roads uh, will be followed. Dewey asked the question, what? And gave answers which indicated the way in which what is qualified. Sellers asked the question, what is? And he found a good beginning to the answer in something and explained something in terms of somewhat. He will go on to a quest today. Dewey uh, did a series of lectures on the quest for certainty. Sellers will quest properties. Uh, he's already told us that he will make some use of Frege in this quest, and therefore the road will probably be bordered by significances and references rather than experiences and natures. But to look any more curiously down the road and to speculate on what happens when you go from ala quale to ala quid would be obfuscation rather than introduction. It is a pleasure to present Wilfred Sellers.
This lecture is called The Quest for Properties, or When is a Sort Not a Sort? At the end of the last lecture, I was, uh, toward the end of the last lecture, I was uh, stressing generalization on the predicate side, as well as generalization on the subject side, which had initially led to the uh, to the importance of, quote, something. And I was making the move, you remember, from Tom is tall to Tom is, well, originally I put it, Tom is something, emphasizing this uh, transcendental or transcategorial something. Uh, but uh, I developed that very shortly into Tom is somehow where uh, somehow is, uh, plays the role in ordinary language akin to that of, uh, of the quantifier which we find in something. Something is tall, Tom is something, or Tom is somehow. And I generalize this, for example, we can go from Jones is a professor and Smith is also a professor to Jones is a something, might even say Jones is a so-and-so in order to get the feeling for how ordinary language can do this. Jones is a something and uh, Smith is also an it or is that thing. And we're to take these words as unities, you remember. Something is not to be split up into something and somehow, as will turn out to be very significant in the argument today, is certainly not to be split up into somehow. Uh, then uh, uh, I emphasize then that we have here a device in ordinary language and there are a number of devices that are involved for generalizing or uh, on the predicate side, uh, uh, even at the sentential side, and doing something here which corresponds in formalized languages to predicate quantification or even sentential quantification. After introducing them, I uh, discussed some, uh, I, I suggested, of course, that we represent this as uh, for some f, then Tom is f. And I discussed some reasons that have led people to suppose that when you seriously use quantification of this sort, you are directly committing yourself to abstract objects, uh, to attributes. Uh, many people would see this and almost as a kind of instinctive reaction, uh, read it as uh, there is an attribute such that Tom, uh, and Tom has it. Uh, and uh, in, in other words, would take this to be a direct uh, commitment to, uh, uh, to abstract objects. In particular, they would be concerned with the truth condition. Uh, for Tom is somehow, uh, or EF Tom is F, they would say, well, surely this is true if and only if. Uh, there is an attribute such that Tom has it. There is an object which is uh, an attribute such that Tom has it. So that uh, we have the, uh, the move that quantification of taken seriously always works over a domain of objects and here then abstract objects. Now to a Fregian or somebody working in the tradition of Frege, and I'm going to have in mind particularly Peter Geach and Michael Dummett, Michael Dummett who just brought out a monumental study of Frege, uh, I'm concerned with these neo uh, who think that they have a way of defending uh, Fregian uh, semantics and theories of reference and uh, sense, uh, which, uh, um, is mo uh, which avoids some of the pitfalls and puzzles that have led people to be uneasy about, uh, about the Fregian ontology. And to a Fregian, this idea that when you when you generalize on the predicate, uh, you are committing yourself to abstract objects. Uh, this argument begs the question. It simply assumes that truth conditions must be given in terms of objects. Uh, of course, they would grant that you can uh, be exclusively interested in interpretations of sentences in which quantifiers range over objects. You could just treat that sentence uh, as though it were, could be paraphrased as there is an attribute, such that Tom has it. Uh, which uh, presumably takes you directly to objects. 
Uh, and one could then uh, introduce the idea of truth on an interpretation and insist that in truth on an interpretation, what we're interested in as logicians is quantifiers which are interpreted as ranging over objects. But for the Phrygian, it seems at least at first sight open to someone to distinguish between truth on an interpretation, which takes that line, and truth period, and uh, would to deny that the truth period of Tom is somehow, or uh, EF Tom is F, uh, the truth period of that uh, involves a reference to objects. Now we have, I appealed last time to Carnap's principle of toleration, or to H.W.B. Joseph's uh, plea for free thinking in logistics. And uh, uh, people working in this uh, line that I'm going to be exploring today uh, demand the right to use the full systematic apparatus of quant quantification in connection with, uh, uh, with predicate variables without assuming either by explication or by considerations pertaining to truth conditions, one is led directly uh, to truth conditions to an ontological commitment to attributes as objects which ordinary objects have. Triangularity, for example, is an object which ordinary triangular things have or exemplify or participate in. Thus, someone influenced by Frege, uh, given this toleration, might say that the variable f ranges over non-objects, or concepts, as Frege called them, and gives a truth condition the following. For some f, Thomas f is, uh, is true, if and only if, for some f, where this is construed now as, uh, as, ref uh, as referring to, uh, to concepts or properties in Frege's sense and Geech's sense. For some f, quote Jones is, uh, is uh, G, uh, is true of f, namely that particular, uh, uh, of some particular uh, uh, concept or property in Geech's sense. Uh, for some, of, so for some uh, uh, property or concept, uh, Tom is F, or Tom is G, is a different variable here, is true. Um, so that uh, uh, for some uh, F, Tom is G is true of F. And we, this would not be interpreted as a matter uh, of F ranging over objects. Now, of course, an alternative approach, but which, however, lacks the ontological excitement, would simply be to take uh, um, a strategy uh, which is known as the substitutional approach, or the substitutional strategy, according to which Jones is somehow is true if and only if some sentence consisting of a predicate and Jones is, is true. Now, as I said, that is a substitutional approach, uh, and uh, uh, therefore it uh, it does not, as such, make an ontological commitment. So it's the former one that I want to follow through today. The former or bolder approach takes the variable f to range over non-objects. One is tempted to say hows. And uh, it does seem to be close to making an explicit ontological commitment to non-objects, though it is not clear exactly how it is doing it. For it won't do just to say that uh, EF, and in some context, F, for some, and read this EF, uh, it won't simply do to say that that tells us that there is a non-object F such that F. We have to do some work uh, because as we started out, this is simply uh, uh, for somehow, uh, some, uh, let's say for example, uh, um, uh, F Tom as the context here, this tells us simply that Tom is somehow and this does not have the, uh, even in appearance, the paradigm form of an ontological commitment, such as we were making, namely, uh, something, um, there are lions, is something is a lion. Now, the insistence that there are non-objects, which things are, does not, of course, preclude the recognition that there are abstract objects or attributes which things have. Indeed, an essential part of Frege's own ontology is that the non-objects we have been considering uh, correspond to objects, which are, as he puts it, their correlates, their object correlates. But now, before discussing attributes as objects, we must come to terms with this Fregean approach. And I'm going to use the word property instead of concept here, 
uh, because, of course, by concept, frigga doesn't mean anything psychological. It means something that is uh, in the extra-linguistic, extra-mental world. I'm going to use the word property then in a Freudian sense and contrast it with attribute, which is supposed to be the classical notion of an object which things have, exemplify, or participate in. Now, it's going to be useful to use a strategy which can be traced back to Principia Mathematica, but which has recently been put to good use by Quine and by Richard Martin, uh, the strategy of virtual classes, as uh, uh, Quine calls it. Now, this, according to this strategy, given a predicate or an open sentence, I'm going to introduce, introduce a certain, uh, some, uh, a small number of technical considerations today, but I'm going to use them again and again, and it's going to be a relatively small apparatus, but which will enable us to understand, I think, exactly what is going on in this neo Fragian movement. Given a predicate or open sentence, we can form a virtual class abstract. Uh, which is itself a predicate, logically equivalent to the original. Now, the important thing about virtual class expressions, and I'll be giving some examples in a moment, according to Quine and Martin, is that while they are not names of the classes corresponding to the predicates or open sentences with which one begins, they can appropriately be read as though they were class membership statements. Then we might start out, for example, with uh, X is red. Now, this is very simple uh, uh, sentence form. Uh, we can say, for example, uh, uh, using substitution, Tom is red. Now, what we do is we form the abstract x colon x is red. This is a new predicate. Now, <clears throat> it's going to do a little something magical in a way. It's, it's purely linguistic uh, terminological device. Uh, but as usual in, uh, in uh, formalizing, people have informal readings uh, which do a tremendous amount of philosophical work, although uh, you can't really find them in the formalism. They just become traditionally uh, hovering, or they traditionally hover around uh, the formal devices, like flies, so to speak. Now what we're going to do, uh, to start with, is put an epsilon in front of this, which is usually read is A. And then we'll read this is an x such that x is red. This is an x such that x is red. So instead of saying x is red, we can say, it, we'll say y is an x such that x is red. Instead of saying Tom is red, we can say Tom is an x such that x is red. And this makes it sound as though we write already were in talking uh, about classes and their members, but uh, without, however, using class names, but simply using a new predicate. So we would have Tom. Uh, is a x such that x is red. Now, the, as I said, the important thing is this sorbel that's creeping in here. X is red. Well, the word red is not a sorbel term. It's not a word like man or horse or cow, uh, which uh, is a count noun. In term, we can say there are five horses and so on. Uh, it is an adjectival predicate. So x is red is an adjectival predicate. But now when we use this abstract, uh, we suddenly find ourselves uh, using sort of talk. We say Tom is an X such that X is red. And as I said, there's no real foundation in the logic here for the reading of this as a sort of, because this is supposed to be a pretty terminological device. And yet, it is invariably read by Martin and Quine as a sortal. So we have then two ways of talking about Tom. One, with respect to red, we can say Tom is red. We can say Tom is an X such that X is red. It's important to note that although the predicate with which we began is not a sortal, the abstract, which is introduced as a terminological device, is treated as a sortal. Quine and Martin tacitly recognize this shift and indicate that if one wishes or prefers, one may simply use the abstract as a predicate by prefixing it to the relevant term. Thus, instead of saying using the epsilon, we can simply use the abstract like this, x such that x is red, Tom. 
So here we have a way of saying time is red. Here we have another way of simply of saying that time is red, but it has, as I said, the atmosphere to it. And is red, even though it's now said to be a predicate simply, it's red as though it were a sort of predicate. It's still red. Time is an X such that X is red. Now clearly, attention, careful attention must be paid to clarifying the exact sense in which a virtual class abstract, so-called, this device, is a sortal, and the problem's going to recur. Now the fascinating thing is, as Martin points out, that the same technique can be used in connection with open sentences containing a predicate variable. Now here, we started out with an ordinary little propositional function or open sentence containing the variable x. We can do the same thing with uh, open sentences in which you have a predicate variable. And uh, so th this is about all the technicalities I'm going to need once I get this next point across. For example, we might start out with uh, uh, for every x, uh, fx or not fx. Uh, this is our might as well put it right straight into symbolism because that will save me time if, I, if I'm going to repeat this. Now this uh, is a, a, an open sentence which contains the variable f. It doesn't tell us, it doesn't say uh, use some specific predicate like for example it doesn't say everything is red or not red or everything is tall or not tall or everything is material or not material. It has a variable in there. Now, just as we uh, here move from the uh, open sentence X is red to this nice abstract which carries these sort of overtones with it, uh, we have here a way of forming an abstract which uh, is as follows. We simply use the same device, F colon, and now we write uh, after this the open sentence for every x, fx, or not fx, um, close the bracket. And this is to be read roughly, to start with, informally, an f such that everything is it or not it, or everything is f or not f. Uh, so that there are two ways in which we can say that everything is red or not red. One way is simply to say everything is red or not red. But another way to say it is to say um, f such that, and f such that for every x, fx, or not fx, red. Or red is an f such that uh, everything is uh, it or not it. So it's a way, interestingly enough, as we see, it's a way of, as it were, pulling out of this definite sentence involving the definite predicate here in this form, of pulling the word red out and as it were, uh, displaying the logical form outside it. And we have over here two uses of the word red. We pull them all together in one, so to speak. As I'll point out later on, this is a, use this is a useful way uh, for doing or attempting to do what, uh, uh, what Wittgenstein said couldn't be done, namely, as it were, to say rather than show what the logical form of something is. That, that, that turns out to be its true interest, but uh, the use that's actually put to it is much more sneaky, as we will see. So playing to the hilt this game of virtual classes, so-called, we read this as red is, uh, red is an f such that for every x, uh, fx, or not fx. Red is an f such that everything is either f or not f. Now, it's essential to note that although red is serving here, at least in appearance, as the subject of a statement of the form blank is a K. Now, we can, let's put it explicitly then. Red is an F substance, so on. Now, this at sur surface has the form blank is a K. Uh, in other words, red is a K. And then we seem we can go from that, it would seem, to something is a K, there are Ks, and uh, we have uh, all the groundwork laid for ontological commitment. 
But actually, of course, red is functioning here, in spite of the fact that it's occurring in this context, it's not functioning as a singular term. Uh, and so, uh, uh, at least it's, uh, it is, at least if you take seriously the verb is in the singular, but actually, uh, it's the word red as a predicate that has been pulled out. It's a predicate term and not a name. So that uh, uh, this would seem to capture uh, the meaning of Frege's term concept. For a concept is not an object, it is not an attribute which is had by objects, it is such as Geech and Dummett insist. Something which everything is or is not. In other words, uh, when you say red, uh, uh, or when you put it like this, F's such that uh, everything is F or not F, red, then what you are saying is red is something uh, which everything is or is not. And uh, that is to be a property and not an object. A property is something that things have. Whereas you'd be saying here that red is something which things are, which everything is or is not. And that is then what we seem to be getting. Now actually, uh, what we do for Geech and Dummett is we take this abstract and we simply rephrase it <laughs> as um, a property. In other words, we're going to define a property uh, as uh, something that everything is or isn't. And that seems to be sensible. Uh, so that when we say, when we use this statement here, we're saying that red is a property. Because we're predicating a property uh, of, uh, uh, of red. And we can say then we have red is a property. And then we can go from that, presumably, to there are properties and we have made deliberate and explicit ontological commitment to properties and uh, uh, done so in a way uh, which grows directly out of logical form and logical considerations. So that if we generalize from red as a property, we get for some f, f is a property. Uh, as a Fragian, we go immediately to there are properties and uh, we have what we want, and we have it in an apparently completely legitimate way. Now, if this line of argument could be defended, it would have two virtues. It would show how a Fragian can make an explicit ontological commitment to concepts and proper or properties, items which things are rather than have, and it would, it would get Frege off a hook, which has uh, probably uh, generated more uh, polemical literature uh, uh, concerning his uh, his logic and ontology than any other uh, than any other uh, group of passages, for example, in his writings. For example, Frege was puzzled about how one could say that red is a concept or red is a property in Geech's sense. For in, if we write red is a is a concept. Concepts for Frege are just not objects. I mean, that's their whole job, is not to be objects. But then, uh, if you look at that, um, the word red seems to be functioning here as a singular term or name, and hence to stand for an object. So it seems to have the absurd form, uh, non-object, or rather object, is non-object and therefore to be false. And what Frege wants to say on the one hand is, red is a concept and not an object. But on the other hand, uh, the very form of the statement seems to be forcing him to say uh, of, a, of an object, that it's a non-object. As I said, a fantastic amount of literature has been written on that single sentence, red is a concept. But now if we use this device here, uh, which as we see is perfectly legitimate until of course we really start taking seriously whether we can get from here to there, but here is a perfectly legitimate logical form. And in it, the word red is functioning predicatedly. Uh, it's, uh, it's, not being, it's not been turned in to a name. And so uh, the promise is then that we can get Frege off that particular hook. And Dummett and Geech uh, are uh, very insistent that this is the way to do it. 
Now, what I've done is to represent by a combination of the formalism of virtual classes and the informal readings which are used to justify the characterization of the formalism as a theory of virtual classes, uh, <clears throat> to explain the line of thought exemplified by Geech's and Dummett's neo-Fragian neo uh, <clears throat> semantics, and in particular, their account of how uh, uh, the uh, above paradox uh, is uh, to, be, uh, to be solved. Now, of course, on a classical account of quantification, uh, supposing we have this, the minute we go from to sum f, we use the abstract, uh, f, we have, of course, gone to the level of objects. Because according to classical theory of quantification, the minute you quantify, the minute you generalize even from a predicate, you've really moved to attributes and you move to objects. But you remember that we are uh, availing ourselves with Geech and Dummett of the principle of toleration. And so we're not going to assume that using the full symbolic apparatus of quantification uh, with respect to predicate variables commits us uh, directly or by considerations pertaining to truth conditions uh, to objects. Well, okay, does this ingenious strategy work? Only, of course, if it is uh, entitled to, uh, and I remember this is read, uh, uh, a property. And only if we are entitled to interpret this as red is a property. Because that's what gets going. The ultimate line which takes us to the commitment there are properties. And if we're entitled then, as I said, to go to there are properties. Of these, the former is crucial. Can we get to red is a property? For once it is granted, the latter seems to follow as a matter of course. Yet even here we must be careful. I've already pointed out that it would be a howler to read EF, F is a property. In other words, even if we forget how we get there, uh, if we, once we assume that we've gotten here, there's a howler you can make in going from there to there are properties. For example, uh, we read that as somehow is a property, just as we read for example, uh, Tom is somehow. Uh, so we read that somehow is a property, but if we break somehow up into somehow, break it up into two words, the little word how now appearing to be a sortal, <laughs> and then we might uh, conclude that we can get somehow is a property. And reason by analogy with some dog is an animal, therefore there are animals, to somehow is a property, therefore there are properties. But how, the how in somehow is not a sortal. It's not really two words, it's only one. The word is a unity, and the appearance of composition is generated by the fact that it is bound up with a family of other expressions containing how. In uh, an apparatus of cross-reference, because one of the jobs done in, uh, in uh, language is, uh, is cross-reference, we could say uh, John is, uh, uh, John is uh, a philosopher, and he is a good one, and we use the word he in cross-reference, we use the word it in cross-reference. Well, there is this apparatus of cross-reference, for example, in the example I gave, Jones is somehow, and Smith is that how. Jones is somehow, and Smith is also it. Or compare something is red, and it is also square. So there's that feature of cross-reference, which makes us think that the word how can be separated out. Well, now, so there is a, there's an obviously mistaken way of getting from this to there are properties. But now, the apparatus we have been considering gives us the appearance of another way of getting to there are properties which avoids that particular howler. Now, I have already suggested that in the case of first order abstracts, the reading of the abstract as a sortal is gratuitous. In other words, we come back to um, x such that x is red. Uh, we read that as an x such that x is red. For example, Tom is an x such that x is red. Uh, the, uh, this involves the absurdity of treating the variable x 
as though it were a sortal, which it obviously isn't. It's an absurd reading, but it's a reading which has been in informally in the literature and in teaching logic uh, for generations. All right. Now, of course, uh, if we're not going to read it as a sortal in that way, we might want to simply take the word, take the an out. But we, if we do that, we simply leave not, we don't have a predicate anymore because we just have a variable there. We don't have a determinative expression. So we need some way to read it. Uh, and uh, what way is there available? Now, I suggest uh, the following, uh, that we read this as a thing such that it is read. A thing, but now notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to be very careful. I'm going to keep a thing all together. A thing uh, such that it is read. You see, now that keeps us, uh, that gives us, a, uh, this is on the analogy of something. Where we don't break something up, something. You see, this is going to be something, a thing, and then there's everything, a whole family of things that have to do with binding the variable, with making a, making a, a determinate expression out of a, an expression with a variable. So I'm going to use a thing such that it is read. Uh, and this uh, will keep us, as I said, from assuming that the, uh, that the abstract must be a sortal because it has the word an in front of it, an x such that. Uh, and uh, therefore, we can say here then, uh, a thing such that it is read, and then we can treat that as the predicate, and we have Tom. So we have two ways of saying that Tom is read. We can say Tom is read, or if we want to play around with this particular uh, formalism, which, in which we get something logically equivalent to, we, to it, we can say a thing such that it is read Tom. Now that is, that is kosher, that is clean, that is, uh, that is pure. It, it, it's not carrying with it all these commitments which are so exciting uh, and uh, which uh, cause so much trouble and which make things people think that they have done things that they have not done. So, remember, we're not reading it as a thing such that it is read, but a thing such that it is read. Uh, and this, uh, this is then uh, something that keeps us from assuming that this has the form Tom is a K, from which we could go to something is a K and uh, be prepared to make ontological commitments to Ks. All right. And uh, now, let us return now to the exciting one, because who cares about Tom? We're really concerned with red. We want to show that red is or isn't a property, or there's a good argument for it, or isn't a good argument for it. So we come back now to our abstract. Uh, F such that for every x, fx or not fx. And we say right. Now let's uh, make the same point that I was making a moment ago about the, the individual abstract. Uh, here again, uh, we must be careful not to read this as an f such that everything is it or not it. You see, there, that would be exactly the same mistake to read this as an x such that x is red. And so instead of reading this as an f such that everything is f or not f, I'm going to read it a how such that everything is it or not it. Or a how such that everything is that how or not that how. Now notice again, this is a member of a family. Somehow is the prominent one that we've been concerned with. Uh, and uh, 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 we might have uh, every how, just as we had uh, uh, something, everything, a thing. So we have somehow, every how, a how. Now this then is going to be our way of expressing what is done to the variable f in this particular kind of context. 
And it is not, as I said, it's not to be read a how, because if you read it a how, then it becomes red is a how, such that everything is it or not it, and by golly, you've got hows. And you get hows simply by splitting up the word a how into a how. And that's exactly the fallacy I want to warn against. Now, uh, a careful reading of uh, Dummett and Geach will, I think, show that this is exactly uh, the sort of move that is lurking behind their very sensible uh, remarks. Because it's, it takes the, the hand is quicker than the eye here. And it takes a little logical, careful penetration to see that, uh, that when you say that Tom is an X such that X is red, that that's really a very misleading way of reading it. And you should simply say, uh, Tom is a thing. Uh, a thing such that it is red Tom. Only with the greatest strength of will can we avoid the temptation to read, uh, uh, for example, this, a how such that everything is it or not it, uh, let's say red, Only with the greatest uh, strength of will can we avoid the temptation to read this in such a way as to give it the superficial grammar, grammar of a sortal. Uh, and thus, by a more subtle mistake, rooted in firmly entrenched habits of reading quantified statements, commit the same error that we committed a moment ago when we went from uh, somehow is uh, uh, EF, F is a property, to somehow is a property, to some how is a property, to there are properties. The sham sortal must be dropped. Now, okay, I think I, I, I've tried to show here then exactly what mistake is being made by uh, Geach and Dummett uh, when they think that they've established an ontological commitment to, uh, to their uh, properties. But as I said, uh, this is a still a useful, a very fascinating logical device. When we say red is a how, such that everything is it or not it, as I said before, uh, we have, uh, we don't have a sortal statement there, but we can uh, formulate it in a philosophically interesting way, because we can say that this is a predicate in a broad sense. And if this doesn't need, if this doesn't say red is a how, such that everything is it or not here, not it, we can still say that we have a, something of the form, well, let's say attributive. Let's say that this is, that we can abbreviate this predicate by the word attributive. And we can say that attributive red, or we can even, uh, if, we're, if we want to be daring, uh, we can say red is attributive. We can read this as red is attributive. But using the, introducing the copula is again something that isn't really warranted by the symbolism, by the actual formal apparatus we have here. But after all, uh, we do feel that wherever a predicate is involved in the subject, uh, a copula is in order. So we might read that as red is attributive. Uh, and then we might say, well, here we have uh, a statement that shows the logical form of red Whereas if you merely say everything is red or not red, uh, or rather the, the, something that tells us what the form of red is, whereas if we simply say everything is red or not red, that simply exhibits, as Wittgenstein said, or shows the logical form. Above all, it must be remembered that attributive red, or red is attributive, is simply another way of writing everything is red or not red. It doesn't have any more content to it. But as I said, what is interesting about it is that it provides a way of saying something that is only shown by the latter, uh, uh, by the uh, expression, everything is either red or not red. All right, as before, appealing to the principle of toleration and free thinking and logistics, we can generalize from red is attributive uh, to EF. F is attributive. <laughs> The last forlorn effort now is going to be made to get over the hump. Uh, but this does not actually get us within shooting distance of there are attributive entities. Unless we feel entitled to read EF, F is an attribute or F is attributive, 
as, for example, there is an entity f such that f is attributive, which amounts to nothing more nor less than abandoning all our carefully constructed clarifications and rushing out um, <coughs> on the verbal bridges which tie quantification so closely to objects. And if we do that, we don't get Geech's and Dummett's properties or Frege's concepts, we get objects, i.e. attributes as abstract objects which ordinary things have and exemplify rather than non-objects which they are. Now, in the next lecture, I shall argue in accordance with the strategy outlined yesterday that, of course, there are such abstract objects as attributes. I shall go on to develop a theory as to just what sort of objects they are. I shall, however, as you might expect, go on to argue that although there are attributes, there really are no attributes. Uh, it will be remembered that the point of really is to indicate that a philosophical point is being made. Thus, in the ordinary sense of really, of course there really are attributes. Now, this argument will go hand in hand with the theory of predication. Now, what I'm going to attempt to do then is to explain next time exactly how the word red does function and what all this is, what all this really comes to, what's really lurking behind this. Because obviously there is, that red is performing a unique kind of function there, and that unique kind of function has been, as it were, reified in a certain way by Geach and Dummett. They have hold of a very important point, but they've, they've uh, transposed it into the wrong theme, the theme of reference. And I'm going to, I'm going then to develop a theory of predication which will add, indeed, first of all, to the bite of the claim that the, while there are attributes, there really are no attributes. But finally, this will move smoothly into a theory of reference, such as I discussed last time, or as I shall say, a theory of representation, which can claim to be the very foundation of a naturalistic ontology. attempted to do is to uh, show that there is a uh, uh, there's an abyss beneath uh, red as a property or red as a concept uh, in other words uh, uh, at the moment I'm not even I mean the implication of my argument is that this is just an illegitimate uh, ill-formed sentence based on these uh, Misread, misreading, so I would not be prepared at this stage to discuss its truth conditions because I regard it as uh, ill-formed uh, and not having truth conditions therefore at all. But on the other hand, uh, uh, let me be clear that I do think that there are properties, I mean that there are attributes, and uh, I do think that red is an attribute. And I will give truth conditions for red as an attribute. But remember, the difference between attribute and property, as I'm using these terms, is that attribute is a good classical term carrying along with the good old abstract entities, uh, which, are, which are objects, individuals, if you will, of a higher level. Uh, whereas I've been using the word property to stand for this, what I now have presented as a misbegotten, as a misbegotten uh, 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 term. So, as I said, I promise you that I will give you truth conditions for red as an attribute. Okay? Yes? I, I think this is the support of what you've been saying, but from the way that I understand Martin's terminology for virtual classes, mm -hmm. uh, there's no necessity, even if you introduce 
predicate variables within the virtual classification yeah. to go to a second order logic with predicate variables outside of the virtual classification? Well, uh, again, uh, uh, that's right. The, the question of how much quantification you're going to do, certainly. He, uh, he specifically follows Quine in supposing that if you do quantify uh, over anything predicated, that you are getting to objects, uh, you see. Now, I don't have that commitment, you see. My, my, it, is, it is my view that quantification does not as such uh, explicitly or by truth conditions uh, uh, carry you to objects, at least in, by directly. I mean, in indirect ways, objects always come in, and I'll be discussing that when I give a theory of reference for predicates. But uh, I do want to free the, uh, the apparatus of quantification uh, from this direct commitment to, uh, uh, to, to a domain of objects. Now, Martin, of course, as I said, uh, uh, says that uh, uh, we are not to quantify uh, virtual class expressions because that takes us to real classes, to real objects, and so on, you see. Now, I didn't, uh, that wasn't the feature, that wasn't the aspect of. Uh, of Quine and Martin's uh, apparatus of virtual classes that, that was useful for my purposes, you see. What was interesting was that they think that by forming these abstracts, you're entitled to use sort of language, you see. And I wanted to show how, uh, if you read Geach and Dummett, here, Dummett's monumental work, it just came out, I'm fascinated by it, because uh, uh, it has uh, this sort of thing, it does come out so clearly in it. This, uh, this is called, uh, Frege, Frege's Philosophy of Language, this is volume one, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a very substantial piece of work, and it's, as I said, uh, there's obviously, there's a lot of truth in it, but <laughs> lurking in it uh, is this, uh, this uh, line of thought which uh, uh, really does make use of this uh, apparatus of virtual classes. It really does. I mean, they don't use the language, they don't use the terminology, but you can take passage after passage and rewrite it in terms of virtual classes of the second order. And uh, this goes back, actually, to, uh, uh, to uh, the 50s, when Geach uh, wrote a paper in which he said, whoa, properties are things, items which things are or are not, not items which things have, and he gives a way of formulating it, which, when you really spell it out, comes down exactly to this same use of, of uh, virtual class abstracts. Other, yes? Yeah, this uh, harks back to last time, uh, in a way. Okay. Um, to put it briefly, do you want to retain the tie, though, if not between quantification and objects, between reference and objects? And yes, if, indeed. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. yes. Well, then, um, I'm wondering why you've uh, apparently been taking it as obvious uh, that uh, s the word something in, say, something is a lion does refer, though in some funny, indefinite, indeterminate way. Uh, uh, perhaps it might be suggested that the point of that second strategy was not to uh, 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 support a claim that uh, there was no puzzlement about sentences like that, but to relocate the puzzlement uh, so there no longer seems to be a puzzlement about reference to all well, objects. Well, I'm not clear uh, who you have in mind when you speak of uh, uh, the point of and the strategy and so on. I'm talking about uh, the, the, the classical, let's say, the quine of uh, the period from, let's say, 50 to 68, let's say, or 70, I mean, when, clearly, when clearly, when uh, clearly, uh, for him, uh, uh, existential quantification was existential quantification and it was referential, it was the bearer of reference, there's where the reference was. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was discussing. I'm at a point one to get out of uh, that second strategy instead of well, what was meant by it. Uh, could you explain what you have in mind by reference as distinct from the reference of uh, 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 that particular ter term something as distinct from its being part of a, a sentence for which there are uh, truth conditions. Uh, I want some idea of how strong this notion is supposed to be and why it is so clear that something must refer to the word something. Well, uh, again, uh, I said that the truth conditions for something is a tiger um, surely involve that some object or other be a tiger. Uh -huh. Now, uh, it clearly doesn't, as I said, refer uh, uh, 
definitely or determinately to any object, but uh, it, it does indeed, in some sense, uh, hook up with, it has to hook up with the world in a referential way. And this is, of course, Quine regiments this as the, as the existential quantifier. He would treat uh, something as a tiger as he acts, acts as a tiger. And he makes that uh, the paradigm as a set of reference. Now, I mean, he's, he's not wrong-headed there. I mean, that's right. There, the, the problem is, you see, how to explain this. And, and he uses the word indeterminate reference. And he stops right there. Now, the challenge, I, the question I was pushing last time was, okay, let's suppose that EX, X is a tiger, involves an indeterminate reference to objects. And uh, to correspondingly, the word something in ordinary usage. It, does, it refers indeterminately to all objects. How are we to understand this indeterminate reference? Now, I said there are two strategies. One is to understand indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. Roughly, that's the substitutional approach. You say something is a tiger is true if and only if some, uh, some statement uh, uh, determinately referring to an object and classifying it as a tiger is true. So you explain the indeterminate reference of something in terms of uh, the concept of the determinate, determinately referring expression. And then the problem obviously there is, well, how many determinately referring expressions do you have? What do you mean when you say some sentence consisting of a determinate referring expression and so on? Uh, how can that possibly be a truth condition for the general statement, something is a tiger? Uh, and uh, of course then the second strategy says, well, language is extendable, it has resources not only that have actually been created, but it has resources that uh, can be added to it. You can always add on to your referring expressions in accordance with uh, uh, certain definite strategies and rules and so on. But then the second alternative simply, as I pointed out, uh, repeats the idea in the truth conditions of indeterminate reference. Distinguish a referring expression in the first place. Uh, I can see uh, uh, all this as a, uh, at least as a response to Klein. Uh, 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 it seems fair enough to take him at, as a, at his word mm -hmm. that uh, something is a referring expression. But I wonder whether that couldn't be doubted. Uh, well, I am going to. Uh um, be offering a theory of reference in the last lecture, but in the meantime, I would just give examples that uh, the word Chicago refers to a certain city, uh, that uh, the word Socrates refers to a certain person, and that in some, the argument that I was giving, and it was appealed to intuition, is that somehow when we say Socrates is wise, that sentence is somehow hooked up with the world. It, I mean, this is one of the interesting features of reference, that somehow there, there's, a, there's a connection between our words and the world, so that in somehow, in somehow the word Socrates picks out somebody. And what that picking out is, well, that's the, that's the problem that philosophers have been dealing with since time immemorial, but that's reference. And of course, something is a unicorn. That uh, is hooked up to the world because what? Something there is hooked are, up. There, yeah, there are objects around. Well, yeah, sure. Well, that's certainly Quine's view that, that uh, something is a unicorn, that sentence is hooked up to the world because something is hooked up, i.e. because EX, X is, or well, the EX apparatus is hooked up with the world. It's the bearer of reference. It's hooked up in the, to the world, of course, in a way in which uh, all <laughs> unicorns are four-footed, isn't it? Uh, well, no, because uh, we have the relation between something and everything here. Everything and, uh, everything and something are both uh, referential, we can define something in terms of everything and vice versa. So that uh, lurking beneath every unicorn is, uh, is white is uh, the indeterminate reference of either something or everything. Yes? Yes. This is yesterday's suggestion put off until today. It's a frank suggestion on indefinite reference and existence assertions. I don't want to suggest that it's Fregian to suggest Fregian to Jesus, but merely to give some weight to an otherwise scatterbrained suggestion here. And I think it's quite possibly correct. When existence is asserted, i.e., there are horses, we never refer to horses, but only to what it is to be to what it is to be a horse. And that and that assertion is that to be a horse is in fact exemplified. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
by something. Yes, we exemplify by something. But we must be careful to note that there is no reference to the exemplifier, according to Prega, but just to the exemplified. I don't... No, that's not fair there, because he actually, surely, uh, uh, exemplification uh, is, uh, it takes two to exemplify, so to speak, like it takes two to tangle. He's just emphasizing that, uh, uh, that uh, what you have there is a, is a, is a reference to the, uh, uh, to the property, and uh, that you are saying that that property is exemplified. Uh, yes, we have a reference to the property. Mm -hmm. We're saying of that property that is exemplified, but we are not referring to the exemplifier of that property any more than... Well, they certainly were not referring to any specific object. Nor, but he certainly... Yeah, but... Nor I dare say we're referring at all. I well, uh, as I said, for Frege, it, it takes two to exemplify, and I think that uh, the problem of indeterminate reference is lurking right there also. I think Frege developed this theory in order to avoid such phrases as indeterminate reference. Uh, Oh, let me put it this way. Uh, uh, every philosopher who uses the term indeterminate reference has a slight queasy feeling. You see, because it does demand, uh, it does demand explication. You see. Uh, you see, you call somebody a husband, you might say. Ah. Well, you know that there's a wife working around somewhere, but you haven't uh, made explicit reference to a wife. Well, if you speak as a property, as, as exemplified, that's like speaking of a property as a husband, or something as a husband. There, there is another party involved, uh, and that can't be avoided, and Frege doesn't avoid it. But he doesn't, I agree, he doesn't offer us a theory any more than Quine does. Well, he offers something different. Uh, I think... No, well, let me put it this way. That existence is the bare... Of, um, uh, uh, uh. See, I think we're talking across purposes. He was concerned with what in the world does the word existence mean? And he was concerned with the question, is existence an attribute? And what he wanted to say was, when you say that something exists, you're not saying of something that has a property, roughly you're saying that some property is exemplified. That's the only point he's making there. And I don't think that it's really relevant to, directly relevant to the concern I had. He was, as I said, concerned with the word exist. Now, you remember, uh, right back uh, five minutes after I started out, uh, uh, yesterday, I, uh, I said, I'm not going to use the word exist, because I'm going to say there are lions, or something is a lion. I'm not going to say lions exist, because the word exist is, a, is an accordion word, which you play lots of music, and there are lots of different contexts in which it's used. Now, as I said, Frege, in the context that you're concerned with, was uh, making the familiar point to us all that existence is not a uh, first-level property of option. You think the unfamiliar point is a higher-level property? That's right. Which is non and as far as I can see, it's not... Covered. As a matter of fact, I'm going to defend the view that existence is a higher-order property. So I'm, in that sense, uh, as I said, uh, there's just one theme in Frege which I'm picking on. But oh, uh, there's so much in Frege that uh, that I that I uh, find sound and, uh, and and correct. So much so that I've written a number of things to call a neo fregian this, a neo fregian that. It's just these neo fregians Geech and Dunman that I'm uh, that I'm jumping on. Now you may say, uh, okay, that's unfair uh, to uh, you're really hitting at Frege through, uh, sort of indirectly, you know, you're really hitting a Frege, but your uh, direct target is, is Dummett and Gish. But no, because uh, they do indeed uh, represent themes from Frege. Uh, and so I, uh, I make them my direct targets, but I do want to indicate there are some features of Frege's ontology that I'm unhappy about. Now, my reasons for being unhappy, I think, will, uh, will sort of uh, uh, become more manifest and, uh, and more complicated, more diversified and spread out, have more foundation uh, when I start to develop a theory of predication because one really can't uh, discuss attributes uh, without uh, having a theory as to how predicates function in language. And I haven't done that at all. What I have pointed out is that one of the great virtues of the Craigian tradition is they insist upon the difference between predicates and names. This I agree, I'm going to agree with 100%. You see, but then, instead of uh, 
instead of being content with that, they go on and say that predicates, well, they're not names. They don't name objects. But they refer to an entity. An entity. A property. You see? Which isn't an object. And that's the theme. See, I'm agreeing that predicates have a unique function and that they're not names. And I'm going to agree that, that words like triangularity are names, or at least they, they're very close to being names, and they do name objects. So I'm going to be trying to tread the narrow path between right and wrong here. <laughs> yes? Yes. Um, you made the remark, uh, 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 a quoted remark, and I guess by saying that, well, with uh, virtual classes, you can't quantify them. The point of that is, you can't quantify over classes uh, uh, to define um, a virtual class. Right? right. Yeah. Now, I mean, with, with this analysis in the case of is red, mm -hmm. it is, is good. I mean, you can regard that as a virtual class. Right. Of course, uh, Breaker was interested in such predicates or, let's say, concepts, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which are defined, in fact, by quantification over all concepts. And right. Because in this case, you don't have analysis of it. Right. And, I mean, this is a remark that goes back to Wittgenstein's tactics. Right. Right. I mean, so this analysis really doesn't apply to the, the scope of predicates. That, no. Uh, no, it doesn't. No, because I'm I mean, simply doing it in, in the case of very, very simple first-order empirical predicates. Because the uh, uh, in the in the Dummett and Geach uh, uh, development of their theory of properties, uh, these are ex exactly the examples they use. Horse. I mean, each couldn't get along without the word horse. Uh, so horse and uh, red and so on. These, these are used, and the apparatus of virtual classes is, in point of fact, used. And it is used to generate sortals in exactly the way that I indicated, and to end up with the ontological commitment that there are properties. Now, that's the argument. And I quite agree that, uh, that, I, that uh, Frege has uh, uh, a tremendous uh, 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 hierarchy indeed of, uh, of these concepts or properties and that uh, they, they are mutually involved uh, with objects in all kinds of ways. So is your argument that attributes don't really exist, will this be an argument that also applies to such, uh, to such concepts as they wanted to define for concepts? Well, uh, I'm going to use the word, I'm going to show that there are and aren't attributes in exactly a sense where it would cover the whole, the whole hierarchy. In other words, I'm going to be discussing, are there numbers? In other words, I want to say there are and there aren't numbers. Classes, sets, sets of sets, and so on. So I am going to be concerned with the whole shebang. But of course, I'm, I must confess that I'm going to be concerned with it problematically and uh, so on, programmatically too. Because uh, I, uh, at certain stages, I actually uh, reach puzzle. I reach the stage where I simply say, "Well, I next year, next year, perhaps. Who knows?" You see. But I'm, I'm trying to report. I'm going to try to report where I am right now, and uh, there will, I'll frankly say, there are problems that, that remain. But it is intended, at least, to take into the into account the full scope of what Freda was doing with his concept. Yes. Will you follow each and take an assortment of common names? Yes. So you have common and proper names. Right. Triangularity would be the same abstract singular. That's right. Right. But then they're also common names. Right. Same sort of common names. That's right. Uh, I like to use the, I mean, I like, uh, I don't know who first introduced it. Count noun. Was it? Yeah. Was that, was that was it I think it was Keach yeah. also. Yeah. No, I, I think that, uh, each has written very illuminating things on uh, on reference and on common nouns and cross reference and so on. As a matter of fact, uh, it's just on this one. This again, it's on the one little theme uh, that I've been picking. But that's what one I think has to do in philosophy. You pick on one theme, and often if you pick on it, it's like a thread. You know, you start pulling on that one little thread. And often you're surprised at what, what unravels. Yeah, we bring in some mass, <laughs> mass terms. Me a third case, as Keith talks about, we can say the same gold here mm -hmm. in these coins and now here in this statue. The mm -hmm. gold is not a count now. Right. 
but it is a common name like because you can perhaps the same to it. The same if you, here. Well, if you put, uh, I prefer, and this is just the old Aristotelian matter term. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you'll bring in identity conditions of that. Yeah, and then I, I always uh, think of gold or marble as requiring the prefix piece of or chunk you know, of. That's, or that makes it the count. That makes it a count noun. Yeah, but just. Well, I think you can still use same even though you don't have the count noun. Yes, well, that's I'm more dubious about. I think uh, my suspicion is that uh, that there's always a tacit uh, 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 specifier uh, determiner uh, along with it. Mm -hmm. Certainly, that would be the Aristotelian uh, yes. interpretation. Uh, and uh, I mean, after all, the notion of a mass uh, of a mass term, mass particle, is essentially a very classical one. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, it's certainly true that pre-Socratic philosophy is built on right. the notion of, and it sort of disappears in Plato, uh, later Plato, but it uh, emerges in Aristotle and has been used ever since until it was... Uh, see, there was a long time, as you know, uh, when philosophers, uh, under the influence of Principia Mathematica, simply used uh, uh, the form f of x um, indiscriminately. You know, they would say, uh, for example, f of x, well, for example, x is red, or f of x, well, for example, x is a man, you see. <coughs> or f of x, well, for example, Tom runs, you see. And they, would, they would use that same formalism to represent really different, radically different logical structures. Uh, and uh, philosophers after the war began to realize that this was just uh, running things together, uh, which should be separated, and much uh, philosophy of logic that hasn't been in the realm of modality since then has been in the way of straightening out the more basic logical forms that were run together by this simple formalism. And of course, one, what well, we have now, x is a k, for example, x is a man, and uh, we have x runs, we have, we, and we get the logic of verbs, we're getting the logic of adverbs, and so on. All of these uh, uh, niceties which were just uh, blurred together uh, in the first impact of Principia, and which of course always annoyed uh, the, the daylights out of anybody who had a sense of the sophistication of discourse. It always annoyed people uh, to, to hear uh, people under the influence of Principia sort of lumping all of these nice distinctions together under uh, F of X. And uh, they, they were rightly annoyed. I mean, I think that, uh, uh, that uh, they suffered in, not, not always in silence either. But still, there was something gained. The point is that the, the, uh, the formalism then simply had to grow and grow and grow to catch up the, to the distinctions. But so uh, there were people who suffered, uh, uh, but they've been vindicated, so to speak. Uh, they have, uh, uh, you know, like, I guess, uh, I guess Bukharin hasn't been quite re rehabilitated yet. Certainly Trotsky hasn't, and so on. But uh, there are a lot of non-persons and people who, who went through uh, this civil war philosophy who are being rehabilitated by the fact that the points they insisted upon, namely that certain distinctions were being blurred, was correct. Yes? Um, I gather you consider it's important to naturalism to be able to say that attributes don't really exist in a strong sense. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm curious here, are you going to talk about what it is to be an object also? Because yes. it strikes me that there right. is right. another way of saying that attributes really do exist, and that is to weaken the concept of what an object is. I have to, the two go stand together, yes. Right. In other okay. words, I have to, to say, as I will, that attributes don't really exist is going to be to say, well, the word object is a, one we have to look at pretty carefully, and then I'm going to draw a distinction between different kinds of objects, and uh, show that attributes are a strange kind of object. They're a strange kind of object, but they're still not Freudian entities. They're still objects. They're very funny objects. But they're in the world. And they can be referred to. But that, I mean, after all, uh, you can't expect me to Give next week's lecture. No, today. <laughs> but then no, I, I just wanted. I'm I sure don't want to get the no, I, I I know that you're, you're quite correct. You're quite correct in being anxious. <laughs> <laughs> you're quite correct. You know what I should do. Right. You're quite right. I'm going to try and do it. Yes. 
Now, what is your argument for not taking the virtual class abstract as a sort of aside from the fact that it leads to these unde undesirable ontological consequences? Oh, simply because there's no justification in the way it's developed for treating it as a sort of. Just a notational abbreviation. Just a notational abbreviation, really. It's just a new notation for X is red. Right. Yes. Do you see the same temptation to reify with, uh, say, relational expressions, verbs? Uh, you mentioned adverbs. Oh, yes. Something. I think exactly the same. Now, I, uh, I attempted to stick with something. Uh, an example of sort of was uh, almost perceptible, you might say, uh, red. Uh, but I could have taken a verb or relational words. Uh, uh, the same, you can, the, the same apparatus of the virtual classes uh, can come from there too. The same, exactly the same uh, uh, puzzles arise, and exactly the same pitfalls arise. Well, uh, I think then, oh, Moran? Uh, yeah, I, I found the, the argument very interesting that uh, it's important to keep your uh, uh, different type quantifiers separate and that what's uh, really scary about predicate quantification is the mistaken idea that you've got a unified yeah. uh, quantifier uh, and therefore that it's much the same kind of quantification that you're using on objects. Right. Uh, I, I thought that was really an interesting idea. And uh, the question just is to try to get a little more precise as to your intuitions on unification. Um, between the idea of unifying all the domains of all type variables, um, which runs into serious logical difficulties, mm -hmm. Uh, and the idea of keeping each one separate, there's sort of a halfway house of cumulative type theory, uh, where you start out with variables over the over yeah. lower types and then cumulative variables. And I wondered whether your intuitions were that that was also a mistake or not. I, I expected that it might be. Well, uh, let me put it this way. My general my, if you wanted to kind of, if you wanted to classify me, I mean, people like to classify. If you wanted to, wanted some isms, and I mean, I've been throwing isms around, so I might as well be uh, hung for a sheep as for a lamb. Uh, my basic uh, approach is in substitutional and, construct and constructionist. In other words, uh, so I do intuitively uh, uh, respond to the idea of constructed hierarchies of, of expressions, uh, so that that would be the way my intuitions go. That the cumulative, cumulative, yeah, would be all right. So that you could have, say, a variable that ranged over predicates and objects, and one that ranged over predicates. Well, that and predicates I would, and I would want to be. Uh, I would want to say yes and no to that because uh, there. I have to lay the groundwork by a discussion of what objects are, because uh, it's going to I, it's going to turn out that uh, higher order objects are very funny objects, and they're much closer to being predicates, uh, predicated than than it might appear at first sight. So that there is a little bridge there, which I can't uh, which I can't present to you now, but which would make it uh, a little less paradoxical in the speak of unifying. Uh, 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 quantification over predicates and quantification over objects, so to speak. Yes? Yeah, I, I, I just a question of clarification. Is that the point about, about the Frege's uh, conception of the quantifier as opposed to the quantifier that he sees this enormous gap between first order and second order theories, mm -hmm. whereas with Frege, since the quantifiers are just predicates of higher order right. objects from the beginning, right. you don't get this gap, you can get right. first level concepts, second level concepts, and so on. Right. You get quantifiers beginning as predicates of concepts from the start, so that mm -hmm. there isn't this gap. Yes, yeah, so he doesn't, he doesn't, <coughs> of course, he, 
Uh, he doesn't object to, to having predicate quantification in only effect. Uh, as well as quantification in effect. Yeah. Well, uh, well the, the, the quantifiers are predicates, so. Yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. From the beginning. So there isn't this gap. That's right. First order and second order. That's right. In other words, there isn't the gap between predicate quantification and object quantification because it's all predicate quantification in a way, right? It didn't have Russell's theory of description. That's right. right. Well, then, uh, you have uh, you've had an attack today uh, on a central theme because, I mean, in ontology, I would suggest uh, the issue of attributes and properties and things like that is the central issue. And it rubs off into the philosophy of mind. You can't, you can't deal adequately with the philosophy of mind unless you make up your minds to uh, uh, there are or are not objects or entities of this of, the, of this type. And uh, uh, so it's, it's worthwhile in contrasting two approaches. But next time I'm going to just develop. I'm going to stick my own neck out and uh, give you the alternative. Uh, this afternoon, Professor Wilfred Sellers will present the third in his series of John Dewey lectures on naturalism and ontology. The title of this lecture is The Importance of Being Dispensable. In his second lecture last Friday, Professor Sellers gave us some intriguing promissory notes about objects and existence. I have no doubt that he will fulfill these promises, but the interesting and important question is just how he will do it. So I just want to say to Professor Sellers, on behalf of all of us, welcome back. Yes, there are two kinds of correctness involved in that, in promissory notes like that. There's fulfilling the promise, and then there's the correctness of, uh, of what you say. And uh, I was hoping, I was wondering how far this connotation of achievement and success was going to carry over there. Today I want to approach the questions raised in my first lecture from a somewhat different perspective. Thus, although the topic with which I shall begin belongs under the general heading of the relation between language and the world, it uh, deals with a different, though intimately related aspect. Thus, in my first lecture, I was concerned with the problem of reference to objects, and in particular with how expressions which refer to objects are, so to speak, hooked up with the objects uh, concrete or abstract to which they refer. Today I shall turn my attention to predicates, and while I've already touched on them in my second lecture, my concern was primarily with the question of ontological commitment, and in particular with neo fragian attempts to show that an explication of logical forms takes one directly to a domain of predicative entities entities which are not objects and which are referred to by predicates. I shall have more to say on this topic at a later stage in the argument. For the moment, I shall simply stress that one of the key merits of Frege's philosophies of language was the stress he placed on the distinctive role of predicates, uh, or concept names, or incomplete or unsaturated names, uh, i.e. with expressions, uh, uh, the distinctive role of predicates by which he meant to contrast them with expressions referring to objects. But it is not enough, uh, however, to agree with Frege uh, that the role of predicates is distinctive, but rather to give an account of what it is that makes them so distinctive. For if the argument of the last lecture is sound, we are precluded from giving Frege's answer. Uh, now, the best way of developing an independent account uh, <clears throat> is by exploring some of the familiar dialectical moves which have been made in this connection. Thus, consider the two statements, A is red and A is green. 
where A refers to an object which is in point of fact red. It is obvious that the words red and green contribute something to the meaning of the two sentences. Furthermore, it is equally obvious that there must be something in the extralinguistic domain which accounts for the fact that the first of these statements is true and the second false. I say that these things are obvious, but they are also puzzling, as would in any case uh, uh, be made manifest from the use of the words meaning and true, and of course, of the word something. Realism, and I have in mind, of course, that sense of realism which is traditionally associated with the problem of universals, conceptual realism as contrasted with realism in the theory of perception, realism in the broadest sense might be characterized as the above thesis, uh, that there must be something in the extralinguistic domain which accounts for the fact that the first of these statements is true, the second false. Uh, and since this thesis is obvious, it might be thought to be non-controversial. In philosophy, however, the bitterest controversy seem to center around the obvious, and without pressing at this time the words meaning and true, which will be engaging us soon enough, we can get the key dialectical moves underway by noticing that when it is said that there must be something in the extralinguistic order, which accounts for the fact that the first of the above statements is true and the second false, we would immediately expect, in the light of our awareness of the versatility of something, to find a distinction between three general forms of realism. I'm not going to call them extreme, moderate, and so on, uh, uh, but there will be some historical overtones here. Uh, a distinction between three general forms of realism. First, that which is willing to split up something into something and say that what makes A is red true and A is green false is the presence of a thing or object of a special kind, a universal or attribute, which is referred to by the word red and the absence of the corresponding object which is referred to by the word green. Now, the second form of realism, that which, while willing to split something into something uh, and making the same general statement, denies that either red or green refers to an object, a realism, if etymology will forgive us, uh, uh, of non-things. Once tempted to use Kant's word, undinger. Both of these forms of realism can be called entitative to use a good scholastic term, because each of them construes the truth of A is red in terms of the presence of an entity, whether an object or a non-object, which is referred to by the grammatical predicate. Obviously, the third general form of realism will be a cagey form, which, while it agrees with the obvious, yet refuses to break up something into something and refuses to explain the truth of A is red in terms of an entity which is referred to by red. It is realism in this third sense which I propose to defend. Now for the dialectic. As good a place to begin with is Russell's classic argument for universals in his Problems of Philosophy. Since almost everybody either cuts their teeth on it or uses it in their classrooms sooner or later, I can be uh, brief and paraphrase freely. Russell argued that even the simplest sentence, which is capable of truth or falsity, must consist of more than expressions for particular objects. In addition to names, we need expressions which are not names of particulars. For example, we need such expressions as white or to the north of. Even if we think we can dispense with white, we will find ourselves hooked, uh, we will find ourselves using resembles. Uh, and since there are difficulties, difficulties about dispensing with white and the attempt to dispense with resembles in terms of resembles, uh, in terms of resemblance, uh, or in terms of a particular resemblance leads to familiar puzzles, we might as well reconcile ourselves to white, Russell points out, as well as resembles. 
Well, suppose that Russell is right, and we do need such words. Grammatically, they are predicate, words like white, red, green. Russell has not shown that we need abstract singular terms. White, yes, but not whiteness. Resemblance, yes. Re excuse me, resembles, yes, but not resemblance. We need expressions which are not names of particulars. Do we need expressions which are names of non-particulars? Russell takes it for granted that the answer is yes. Two considerations are obviously foremost in his mind. One is the general thesis of realism, in the sense in which it expresses an obvious truth. The other is the fact that there actually are abstract singular terms in everyday use, which certainly are meaningful, look like names, and do not name particulars. Some of these uh, are formed from predicate expressions by the use of such suffixes as itty, hood, ness, dumb, and in Harding's uh, idiolect, c, as in normal c. Where one, is, where one isn't at hand, it can be found formed by prefixing the predicative expression with being, as in being 10 feet high. What then would be the relation of a predicate to its correlated abstract singular term? A number of sophisticated moves are obviously available, but it is best to look at the most naive, since that is how the traditional dialectic continues. But let, uh, let us call it the simplest, since, uh, since uh, uh, it can be and has been elaborated and defended in highly sophisticated ways. This simple move argues that the difference between predicates and abstract singular terms is a superficial one, a matter of surface grammar. However, the grammatical duplication is to be accounted for. It is, in principle, odios. I shall speed up the dialectic by moving directly to principia notation. I would certainly not claim that this notation with its orientation towards mathematics is adequate to express fully the logical form of even the simplest empirical statement, but it does capture some of it. One is tempted to say it's skeleton, and much recent ontology has made full use of the fact. Thus, since the stage of dialectic we are tuned in on is not concerned with time or tense, it feels entitled to drop the copula and write A as red as simply red A. Thus, uh, to use a different example, the move we are considering finds the difference between triangular A and triangularity A to be purely superficial, not reflecting a significant semantical difference. Indeed, the latter, despite its uh, uh, obviously contrived character, is supposed to be a more accurate portrayal of the semantical content of the assertion. We have here uh, something referring to uh, the abstract entity triangularity, the form, the essence, the the attribute, and we have an expression here referring to a concrete object. Uh, uh, we might have a little triangle down here. There's A. And of course, I'm concerned with rough and ready triangularity, and if you prefer, you can contemplate uh, one of Plato's mathematicals and uh, get a better example, but this, is, uh, this will serve one purpose or the other. Turning our attention now to relations uh, and using a schematic mode of representation, we are ready for a watershed in the dialectic, Bradley's puzzle about relations. Consider one, R, A, B, where A and B are to be construed as dummy names of particulars, and capital R is constru construed as R hood, uh, the dummy name of a relation. Bradley, in effect, argued that in order for one to be true, the items A, B, and R, or R hood, must be related. The mere collection A, B, R, or R hood, I'll take that to be sort of understood, that capital R is carrying a little hood around with it, 
uh, uh, the mirror collection ABR is not a fact, and if RAB, our sentence there, uh, simply stood for a collection, it would be a collection of expressions and not a statement. But if A, B, and R are related, there must be a fact-making relation R prime, which relates them, which binds them together. And if one is to be true and not a mere list of symbols, it must affirm that this relation, it must uh, affirm that this relation obtains. To do so, it must refer to the relation. Since it does not do so, since this sentence does not explicitly refer to the relation R prime or R primehood, it must do so implicitly. Presumably, for Brad Bradley, it does so by expressing an act of the understanding in which so much, as we know, can be implicit. All right. One then implicitly becomes two. Uh, R prime, R A B. Well, you can see that uh, Bradley has so set it up that it just chugs merrily along now, and the primes begin to add up. In other words, uh, we would have A and B again, the names of the particulars, R the name of a relation, and R prime the name of this new relation, which was implicitly lurking there before. And once again, we say that in order for two to be true, um, the items A, B, R, and R prime must be related. The mere collection A, B, R, R prime is not a fact, and if R prime, R, A, B simply stood for a collection, it would be a collection of expressions and not a statement. But if A, B, R, and R prime are related, there must be a fact-making relation, fact relation R prime which relates them. And if it too is to be true and not a mere list of symbols, it must affirm that this relation obtains. To do so, it must refer to this relation. Since it does not do explicitly, it must do so implicitly. When its content is made explicit, therefore, two becomes three, R double prime, R prime, A, B, and so on. Now, what in, now when, in 1918, Russell was hit by Bradley's paradox, many years after he first encountered it, I mean, after all, realists for a long time had been scoffing at Bradley and saying, why the business of relations is to relate, and turning to some other topic. But Russell in 1918 was suddenly hit by Bradley's uh, regress. And uh, after uh, setting a considerable amount of stage setting, he resolved it in the following familiar way. He argued that one, and I can forget about uh, two now since Russell is going to save us from, uh, from uh, having to take that leap. He argued that one, R-A-B, uh, expresses that A and B stand in R, in the relation R, not by covertly naming the relation of standing in, but itself by itself being a relational pattern. He said this is a relational pattern itself. And it expresses that A, B stand in R, that A, B, and R are connected, uh, as opposed to a mere collection or list or heap, by itself being a relational pattern, and he tried to describe this. Now, Russell owed uh, his central insight to Wittgenstein, uh, although he was not as clear about it as he might have been, and indeed, uh, as we shall see, he misapplied Wittgenstein's strategy. If we echo Wittgenstein's uh, uh, well-known thesis in the Tractatus, in the context of the problem as Russell saw it, it becomes, and I'm going to put this on the board, we're going to have a number here, because this is uh, a theme about which it's absolutely essential, I, I think, to get right, if one's going to have an adequate theory of language and of truth and of the connection of language with the world. So the theme that we get from Wittgenstein as applied by Russell, but I'm using a, a Wittgensteinian way of putting it, we say, that A and B stand in R 
by placing the expressions A, B, and R in a certain uh, relation, uh, triadic relational pattern. Notice that this way of putting it has a certain paradoxical aspect which would have warmed Bradley's heart. For in the very process of telling us that we say that A, B, A and B stand in R by relating the three expressions, A, B, and R, that what I've written on the board implies that we can say exactly the same thing by relating the four expressions, A, B, R, and stand in. We say that A, B, stand in R by placing the expressions A, B, and R in a certain triadic relation. There's an internal tension in this thesis, uh, which should be carefully noticed and uh, contemplated. Because if the same thing is said by A, B, and R placed in a certain triadic relation, in that case just, uh, you know, placing them in linear concatenation with the R to the left and the A, B trudging along to the right, if the same thing is said by A, B, and R uh, related in that way, and by A, B, R, and stand-in, doesn't that amount to the idea that stand-in is implicit in uh, R, A, B, as Bradley argued, in which case the regress is off and running. So something has to be done. We have to, we have to tinker with that a bit uh, to make it... Uh, to make it coherent. Now the name model for the constituents of basic sentences threatens to lead us back into the mire. Is there a way of preserving its essential claim without this danger by making minimal, minimal, minimal uh, concessions to the opposing view, i.e. the view that basic sentences consist of non-names as well as names? The answer is yes. But to see how this minimum concession can be made, it is necessary first to increase the pressure by formulating the above principle as follows. Thus, our straightforward realist, our extreme realist, now puts the pressure on and says we can only say that A, B stand in R by placing the expressions A, B, and R, just those three, in a certain triadic relational pattern. Now, at first sight, this is wildly incoherent because it begins by saying we can only say that A, B stand in R, one, two, three, four, by placing the expressions A, B, and R in a certain triadic relational pattern. obviously incoherent. There is a way out. It's a drastic way out. The only way out is to claim that both RAB and 2, uh, this is a different 2 now, AB stand in R, By claiming that both of these simply consist of the names A, B, and R in a certain triadic pattern. A, B, R. The, you might say superficially, this has three symbols and that has, counting this, uh, sort of hyphenating that to make it one, one word there. Uh, superficially, we have one, two, three, four 
expressions which are doing the same general kind of job. But of course, uh, that leads to incoherence. We now have to interpret the syntactical form of two as something that doesn't stand out to the eyes, but to the eye of the mind, this is to be seen as this name, this name, and this name standing in the triadic relation of having a stand-in between them, you see. In other words, here we have uh, the three names in a triadic pattern without anything else, and here we have three names in a triadic pattern with this little uh, additional twist, but the relation is constituted by the presence of a certain symbol. Uh, and we're going to call that an auxiliary symbol. Stand-in, according to this view, is not functioning at all in the way in which normal words uh, function. Uh, and certainly not in the way in which names function. Uh, so that we have here then, uh, in two, uh, looking at it with the eye of the mind, three names, A, B, and R, in a triadic pattern, uh, the pattern of having a stand-in between these two and that one. Now that is a, I mean, that's an interesting triadic relation, but uh, uh, in the... <laughs> in the straightforward, logical sense it is. Thus, uh, from the syntactical point of view, it is argued both one and two have the form a triadic relation obtains between the names A, B, and R. It is, and that, see, that makes this consistent, because now uh, this would have A, B, stand, and R, but also have that form. And so this no longer has that internal tension in it. As I said, you had to tighten up the screw in order to see the way out. It is then argued that stand-in is functioning in a radically different way than the other expressions in two. It is not a disguise name, as are, according to this uh, ontology, ordinary predicates, but an auxiliary symbol. Furthermore, it is dispensable. For one and two have exactly the same meaning as far as their connection with the world is concerned. In this sense, they say exactly the same thing, and this being the case, we can say either one and two both say that R-A-B, or we can say one and two both say that A-B stand in R. Those are semantically uh, equivalent. One way we're using an auxiliary symbol, and the other way we're not. <coughs> One more example of this realistic strategy, and we will be in a position to draw certain morals. Let's take uh, the example of triangular A. Now that's, we're going to take it again, as the realist does, as being triangularity A. Uh, the predicate, ordinary predicates being construed as really, at heart, names of universals. Uh, and we construe the logical form of the latter in terms of the principle. And now I'm going to move directly to the squeeze form. We can only say that A exemplifies or participates in, or instances, or instantiates, or any preference you have. A exemplifies, let's say, Fness uh, by placing the names uh, Fness and A in a conventional dyadic relation. And here we have the names, triangularity and A placed in a conventional way, namely concatenated with triangularity to the left and A to the right. 
Of course, now none of us remember, I'm not, I'm not, it's not involved with consideration that we could use other, uh, as it were, co-referential names. I mean, obviously, we could say that A exemplifies evidence by using uh, some other co-referential co expression here, but that is not the philosophical point we're concerned with. Uh, all right. Now, the internal tension in the statement uh, on the left, the principle on the left, uh, is, re is resolved, in a way, as before, by arguing that triangularity A and A exemplifies <laughs> triangularity. Let's call this three and this four. Uh, that these have the same, I mean, they differ superficially, but they have the same syntactical form. Each consists of the names A and triangularity placed in a certain uh, uh, conventional dyadic relation. In two, in three, the relation is simply that of linear concatenation with the abstract name to the left. In four, it is a matter of the A to the left and the triangularity to the right having an exemplifies between them. So there's the relation of having an exemplifies between them. Once again, uh, exemplifies is doing a kind of uh, uh, it's doing a kind of job there. It's uh, it's uh, essential to the functioning of that sentence, uh, but it, it's not doing the job of referring to anything. Uh, it's doing it is just just being there as a linguistic convenience, you might say. It's there as a patsy. It's uh, it's making it possible for the name A and the name triangularity to be in a certain dyadic relation. <laughs> this time, the dyadic relation of having this word between them. It's just a between word. That's its, that's its job in life, is to be, be between. Uh, or in different, and we can have it in different uh, places, but uh, uh, the point is that its job is to, is to uh, is simply to be the matter, so to speak, uh, for a certain formal characteristic of the uh, names. Uh, as in the case of stands in, uh, exemplifies uh, is not a disguised name, as triangular was construed to be, remember, it turned into triangularity, or any kind of referring expression, but it's an auxiliary symbol. And I want you to think of auxiliary symbol there as auxiliary symbol, you know. Okay, what a, what a way to make a living, so to speak. That's the, that's the important theme that's going to come out. Uh, it is dispensable. For three and four have exactly the same meaning as far as their connection with the world is concerned. In this sense, they say exactly the same thing, and we can put this accordingly, either as three and four both say that triangularity A, or three and four both say that A exemplifies triangularity. Since instead of saying A, B stand in R, we could have said A and B exemplify R, where we would have exemplify as uh, a three-term uh, uh, connection as opposed to here connecting two terms, uh, uh, we can make a general thesis here. Uh, we can say that, in other words, a pair of objects exemplify a relation. We can say one object exemplifies a quality. And so we can put forward a general philosophical thesis. Uh, and here's what our realist does. Uh, uh, he puts the following thesis forward. Exemplification is a tie and not a relation. It can only be expressed by placing the name of a universal and the appropriate number of particulars, n, in this case uh, one, in this case, uh, uh, in the relational case two, uh, in a conventional n plus one adic relation, dyadic or triadic, as we had there. Now, it will not have escaped the knowledgeable listener that the views I have been describing are essentially those of that new Meinongian, Gustav Bergman, one of the most coherent, drive down the road to the bitter end, ontological realists in the world today. 
It is amazing to see how the metaphysics of logical positivism can proliferate in a short 25 years. Now there are obviously a number of puzzling things about this uh, thesis. In the first place, it insists that exemplification cannot be named. Yet exemplification looks as much like a name as does juxtaposition, which according to the thesis is a name. You could say uh, juxtaposition A, B, for saying that A, as we would ordinarily put by saying A is juxtaposed to B, or as Principia would put it, juxtaposed A, B. Juxtaposition is uh, what's really at work there. But uh, he denies that we can make this move with exemplifiers. Exemplification looks like a name, uh, as much like a name as juxtaposition, which according to the thesis is a name. Thus juxtaposed AB is only superficially different for Bergman from juxtaposition AB, where juxtaposition is the name of a relation. Now we would like some story about why A exemplifies Fness isn't only superficially different from exemplification uh, a fness, where exemplification is the name of a relation of exemplification. No such story, however, is forthcoming. Yet, this is not sufficient to discredit the strategy. Uh, and the concept of a tie between objects, particulars and universals, which can only be expressed by placing the names of these objects in a conventional uh, uh, n plus 1 attic configuration does indeed break the Bradley regress. Now it is my purpose to argue that the above strategy is not only correct but is the most basic of three essential elements in a sound theory of language as a representational system. In other words, a sound theory of meaning and truth. Notice that I said that the strategy is correct. Because I shall now argue that although correct, it uh, was misapplied. It begins with too rich an ontology. Or, as we shall see, it walks on semantic stilts. I shall introduce what I take to be the correct application of this strategy, which I have elaborated pari passu with Bergman, by asking the following question. Is it possible to apply this strategy while refusing to treat ordinary predicates as disguised names of abstract objects? You see, this strategy is operating on a level where you're starting with names of abstract objects as well as names of concreta. Is it possible to apply this same strategy while refusing to treat ordinary predicates as disguised names? I submit that the answer is yes. Thus we no longer treat PME's triangular A as a uh, disguised version of triangularity A, but take its surface character as involving a non-name as well as a name the predicate, uh, uh, as involving a non-name, the predicate triangular at its face value. Similarly with relational statements. We no longer treat juxtaposed AB as only superficially different from juxtaposition AB, but take the predicate juxtaposed as, at its face value um, as a non-name. Treating as before such expressions as A and B, etc., as dummy names of non-abstract objects, without as yet scrutinizing what it is to be a name, we return to Wittgenstein's insight, this time giving it its proper application. I move directly to the formulation which forces the solution. And I'm going to start with a relational statement. We can only say we can only say that ARB 
I'm going to just put the R in, in between there now just to make the formulation uh, verbally easier. By placing the names A and B in a certain conventional dyadic relation. Okay, uh, we have uh, one way of doing it. Let's choose a conventional dyadic relation. We might write A on top of B. And of course, uh, uh, let's take as our example A larger than B. Which, now this has this form here, and this has the form which, uh, according to the thesis, is the only form uh, that is uh, involved. It has it directly without the use of any other ingredients. Now from the standpoint of the principle, there might be a dialect of our language in which, and let's call uh, this five, so that I won't have to come over here and call this six, From the standpoint of the principle, there might be a dialect of our language in which six was used to say exactly what is said by five. That is to say, they would have to the sharpened eye the same syntactical form and the same connections with extralinguistic reality. Notice uh, that this time it is ordinary predicates which are interpreted as auxiliary expressions. In other words, what we do is we say, this simply consists of the names A and B in a dyadic relation of having a larger than between them. And remember, we're coming back to that theme of the auxiliary symbol uh, a symbol which plays this very secondary role of making it possible for the real workers, so to speak, uh, to stand in a relation which uh, gives the sentence a distinctive flavor. The unity, you see, I want to emphasize that the crucial thing is the unity of the sentence. Uh, uh, we have two names and they, they form a sentence. In the one case, they form a sentence and make a statement by, the, by one name being related to the other without any additional material, and in the top case, uh, by the use of this additional linguistic material. Thus in five, by using the auxiliary expression larger than, we have uh, brought it about that the names A and B stand in the dyadic relation of having a larger than between them. In six, on the other hand, the names A and B have been placed in a dyadic relation without the use of an auxiliary symbol. Clearly such a dialogue dialect, rather. I've called it jumblies in an essay uh, a number of years ago, naming and saying. Jumblies, uh, um, Edward Lear wrote a famous nonsense poem called Far and Few, Far and Few are the lands where the jumblies live. And so I thought that if anybody was going to speak this outlandish language, it would be the jumblies. And the point about this language is not that anybody wants to speak it, or write it for that matter, uh, but just that it is philosophically illuminating. Uh, whether the jumblies appreciated it philosophically, I don't know, but one of the nice things about jumblies, it'd be awfully difficult to fall into Bradley's troubles if you were a jumblies philosopher. Uh, now, of course, it would be, jumblies would be a most awkward language because it would be difficult to contrive an adequate system of patterns and styles with which to make sentences out of expressions referring to objects. It is much simpler to use auxiliary symbols and linear concatenation, certainly in this Gutenbergian age of ours. Uh, okay. Now you will miss the whole point of this strategy. You will miss the philosophical significance if, as most who encounter it do, to my horror, if you say to yourself, I suppose you could, 
use A over B to say that A is larger than B? You know, I suppose we could refer to the future in soprano, the present in tenor, the past in basso profundo. A nice point to make once, but why run it into the ground? But the possibility of using A over B to say that A is larger than B is the trivial aspect of the thesis. The important aspect is the claim that we can only say that A is larger than B by placing the names A and B in a conventional dyadic relation. That's the crucial point. For it is this which is the foundation, as I indicated, of a correct account of meaning and truth. Thus, one who is simply struck by the fact that we could use A over B to say that A is larger than B will be tempted to look for some aspect of A over B. He's going to look for some aspect of 6 which is doing the job done in 5 by larger than. For example, he might say, well, the fact that A is above B is doing the job that's done by larger than. Or A's being above B is doing the job done by larger than. That's an important job. It is absolutely crucial to appreciate that nothing in six is doing the job done in five by larger than. It is absolutely crucial to appreciate that nothing in six or about six is doing the job done in five by larger than. Many philosophers have stared this point in the face and moved on. Obviously, the fact that A is above B is essential to the semantical role six is playing. But that fact does not do the job done by larger than. Rather, it does the job done by, in the case of uh, five, by the fact that A and B have A larger than between them. That's the parallel. Again, nothing in six or about six is doing the job done by larger than. It is a simple larger than is doing this auxiliary and purely auxiliary job, and nothing in six is doing that job. That has to be absolutely clear. As I said, otherwise, the thesis looks like a trivial thesis. And as I say, I think it's... Uh, uh, it's, it's a very, very significant and important thesis, but then I, I have to defend that. This is no, more quibble, no mere quibbling, as should become clear when one realizes that the larger than in five, for example, is an object, a linguistic inscription, and not a fact. Indeed, Wittgenstein's own failure to appreciate the full significance of this analysis can be traced to his ontology of facts. Uh, I discussed this in... Uh, uh, Truth and Correspondence, where I point out that Wittgenstein, uh, again, walked up to this tremendous insight and moved on and didn't make adequate use of it. Now, what the above amounts to the claim that not only are predicates expressions, not only are predicative expressions dispensable, but the very function performed by predicates is dispensable. This, if true, would strike a blow at the very heart of Frege's semantics. Let me therefore hasten to add, to forestall a serious misunderstanding, that I'm applying Wittgenstein's strategy, as he did, only to empirical or matter-of-factual predicates, including those of theoretical science. Thus, the term predicate is often used in a broad sense in which any open sentence is characterized as a predicative context. It is important, therefore, to see that when I say that the very function of predicates is dispensable, I am not making a claim which is absurd on the face of it. It may, in the last analysis, be absurd. Philosophical error always is in the last analysis. But its absurdity will have to be shown dialectically, by philosophical argument, not by pointing. Now, from the perspective I've been developing, Frege had two important insights about concept words 
of the kind corresponding to the predicates I've been discussing. In the first place, they are not names of objects. In the second place, predicates contribute in a unique way to the semantical role of the statements in which they occur. His mistake was to assimilate that role to the general category of reference so that predicates refer to non-objects. Now, see, I'm giving predicates a unique kind of role, but it's a very unique kind of role. It doesn't involve reference at all, but it still contributes to the job done by the sentence because it makes the sentence of a certain character, and that is going to be the place where the sentence ties up with the world. It doesn't tie up with the world with longer than or larger than. It ties up in the world with the fact that it is a sentence having the character being two names uh, which have the stand in the dyadic relation of having a larger than between them as opposed to some other auxiliary uh, some other auxiliary uh, expression like smaller than or redder than or so on. We are also able to locate an insight of coins. He has argued in, on what there is and other places that predicates are syncategorimatic expressions contributing to the meaning of sentences without having reference. They present the etiology of a language, as he puts it, rather than its ontology. They are said to be true of objects. Red is true of A, just in case A is red. But Quine does not offer a theory of just what it is in which this sudden categorimatic character consists. He relates it, however, to inaccessibility to quantification. Indeed, that seems to be almost just a defining trait. That's his explanation of it, that the predicates are just that sort of place where you don't quantify. <laughs> He's uh, somewhat milder about this now because, of course, substitutional quantification is now uh, causing him uh, some interesting dialectical troubles. But at the time he wrote uh, on what there is, uh, that seemed to be all there was to it. Now, my analysis, as I see it, explains the syncategorimatic character of predicates without any reference to quantification. Uh, thus, the role of generalization, which is what quantification really is, is not tied to objects, in my view. Though trivially, of course, generalizations about objects are. Now, from the perspective I've been developing then, well, now, if predicates are simply auxiliary symbols, this entails that the connection of a statement with extralinguistic reality does not directly involve a connection between a predicate and an extralinguistic reality. The presence of the predicate gives the names a distinctive character by virtue of which they, they, the names, are connected with extralinguistic reality. But the names could have had a distinctive character of equal effectiveness if the statement contained no predicate, as we've seen. Names which have a larger than between them are the linguistic counterparts, the linguistic uh, representative, so to speak, of objects, one of which is larger than the other. But in the dialectic, or rather in jumblies, uh, names, one of which is placed above the other, are the linguistic counterparts, linguistic representatives of objects, one of which is larger than the other. In each case, the distinctive character by virtue of which names of that character function as linguistic counterparts of objects, of which one, for example, is larger than the other, is a matter of convention. Thus, instead of larger than, the auxiliary symbol could be glubber than. And in the dialect, the same statement now made by 6, with A over B, could have been made with B over A. Now, clearly, a theory of linguistic representation will view the connection between either 5 or 6 and extralinguistic reality as involving two dimensions. A, a dimension in which each name is a linguistic representative of an object and can be said to refer to that object. And B, a dimension in which names, by virtue of a certain character, constitute statements. In that logician sense of statement, which has nothing to do with illocutionary force and can be said to characterize the object referred to. In other words, we're going to have to use these materials now to develop a theory of reference and of characterization. 
Thus, in the statement 5, A is larger than B, the first name is an A, the second name is a B, and the names have the character of having a larger than between them. Just how these facts about the names are involved in the semantical functioning of the sentence is the ultimate question with which these lectures are concerned. It is, however, one which must be approached with care and the right tools. Thus, before advancing to the assault, it will be well to retreat a bit, consolidate our ground, and clear away some additional sources of misunderstanding. In the first place, a brief look at one-place predicates. Here the principle becomes we can only say that FA using the dummy brief dummy for it by tokening. and A in a certain style. Conventional Thus, uh, we're going to have the two sentences 6 and 7. 6 is red A and 7 is make that look a bit more A. Thus consider 7 and 8. Rather, that's, yeah, that's 7 and 8. Consider 7 and 8. As before, these two sentences, one in the uh, jargon of Principia, one in Jamblis, make the same statement. Each has as its syntactical form the character of being an A written in a certain style. Here it's a sort of, say, triangular style number 11, 12, and this is uh, the style of being preceded by a red, being preceded by a red. That's style for you. Notice, therefore, that 8 has two semantically relevant characters. One by virtue of which it is an A, a generic character which admits of a wide range of determinate values. The other by virtue of which it has a certain style. This need not consist in its having a certain shape. Indeed, it might be a matter of size or color. Wittgenstein made interesting suggestions in the Tractatus about how the, compatible, the compatibilities and incompatibilities of semantically significant styles might reflect the compatibilities and incompatibilities of quality spaces. Thus the fact that 8 is an A is bound up with the fact that it refers to A. And the fact that it is an A in a certain angular style is bound up with the fact that it characterizes A as red. Just how these features are bound up with reference and characterizing is exactly the question I was referring to before. It's the central problem of the theory of linguistic representation. We can say that A is a linguistic representation or a counterpart of A, and that names which are in a certain style, e.g. concatenated with a red, are linguistic counterparts of red objects. In the latter respect, it will be useful to speak of such names as having a counterpart character. For example, uh, this name here has a counterpart, car counterpart character of uh, being a now I'm just going to use red asterisk. It's going to be a red asterisk A, so that we can save seven. Seven is an red, or it is A, red asterisk A. That means it's an A which is uh, um, which is concatenated to the left with a red. But then we can also use this in a more generic way to refer to anything that has the corresponding counterpart characteristic. For example, this could even be said to be a red asterisk A because it has, the, it has a certain style by virtue of which it is semantically equivalent to something which is concatenated 
uh, with the predicate red. Now, to conclude this afternoon's lecture, it must be stressed that nothing in eight or about eight is doing the job done in seven by red. Obviously, the fact that eight is in angular style 11 is essential to the semantical role that it is playing. But that fact does not do the job done in seven by red. Rather, it does the job which is done in the case of seven by the fact that A is concatenated to the left with the word red. Thus, the same points made above about the merits and demerits of Frege's account of empirical predicates in the context of relations applies equally to one place predicates. Now, I think you will understand why I call this lecture the importance of being dispensable and the importance for ontology of the dispensability of predicates. Thank you. We'll take a short break, guys, and then we turn for questions. Is there a question directly, Professor Sellers? Yeah. Um, I, I actually have three points. I mean, they sort of speak together, but okay. maybe you should just interrupt me if at some point you want to do this. Uh, the first is about Bradley's infinite regress. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't really see that as a difficulty. I mean, it's it's a good argument that there's a, that there's a, an infinite number of propositions implicit in a proposition we utter or maybe uh, an infinite number of relations uh, that are implicit in a uh, proposition that we utter. But that, that seems to me not to be paradoxical. Can I answer that, take that first? Uh, actually, of course, uh, there are two regresses here which must be carefully distinguished, one of which is benign, the other is vicious. I mean, for example, uh, there is the regress, for example, snow is white, it is true that snow is white, it is true that it is true that snow is white, Etc. So that's, we're all happy about that because there's no claim there that uh, the very concept of Snow's White being true has to be analyzed in terms of the truth of the truth that Snow is White. Mm -hmm. Now that's exactly where uh, Bradley's argument comes in, and of course, as you suspect, uh, uh, since he was an extremely uh, able dialectician, uh, uh, he was concerned with a vicious regress. The argument was that in order for uh, A, B, and R uh, to be a to make make a statement and not be a mere list, you see they the sentence must somehow affirm that A, B, and R are connected, and then if you bring in the connection simply by another name, you see which what Bradley did, obviously then you're going to get uh, you're going to have to you're going to get another name in there, and then you're going to raise the question what holds these together, and you're going to get so as he actually sets it up, it is a vicious regress, and the point is that you can easily See, the, I mean, the point is that uh, uh, Bradley's regress is of historical interest in terms of the dialectic that has been operating in ontology since 1900. I mean, sooner or later, people see what's wrong with it, and they can stop it somewhere. Now, the interesting thing is that some realists, Russell, for example, and Bergman and others, stop the re regress at the stage where they say, well, all you need to have is a concatenation of names. You see, it's the concatenation. Of it. A sentence isn't a mere list of names. It's a relational structure of them. And that's the answer. Of course, that's the correct answer to Bradley. But then you see, once you spell out exactly what the dialectical moves there are uh, in, that, in that gambit, then you see uh, how it can be used, as Wittgenstein used it in the Tractatus, as I did it at the end. So that's the first point, that Bradley's uh, regress was, in point of fact, a vicious one, that there is a benign one in that connection, because I'll give it to you. It's indeed true that A exemplifies Fness. Now, in my view, it's also true that uh, A and Fness ex uh, exemplify exemplification. And it's also true that A, Fness, and exemplification exemplify exemplification because I'm going to analyze exemplification in terms of truth. And it turns out that that's just a cousin of snow is white, snow is white, snow, it is true that snow is white, it is true that it is true that snow is white, and so on. Uh, and equally benign. And there's where, uh, you see, there's where my little tacit challenge was to Bergman, who doesn't give us any account at all uh, of exemplification, other than it's uh, a tie which cannot be named by something that looks very much like a name. Yeah. Okay, number two. Number two. 
There is a, uh, you see, you said, well, if one's going to stop the analysis at, a, at five, A larger than B with mm -hmm. three terms, mm -hmm. and then refuse to make explicit the, the three-term exemplification, mm -hmm. uh, then why not stop at six mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and refuse to, right. to add the name uh, of the relation between right. A and B? But of course, there is a difference. That is, A is heavier than B. Uh, and so on, or C is heavier than D. All of these, the three term exemplification, will all be the same. Right. Okay? But, right. Uh, so, well, as so I said, really John Lees, John Lees is going to be, uh, if you'll reflect on it, John Lees is going to be fantastically complicated. Because, you see, in order to say that A is larger than B, you do this. In order to say that A is greener than B, you do that. Right. And after time, you run out of style. Right. Now, my point is, of course, that in, if one stops only at the three-place uh, mm -hmm. relation, naming the, the relation right. between A and B, then one has only that one form, right. that one three-term. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. And that's why, as I said, particularly in our Gutenbergian age, we're, we're, we're happy with uh, uh, with linear concatenation. Mm -hmm. But uh, philosophically, you see, the point is uh, that uh, uh, we want to understand how this is functioning. Uh, and uh, I, mind you, I haven't refuted realism yet of the, of the straightforward kind. See, I've just taken pot shots. What I've done is to show that in principle the same strategy can be used one level down. Now, what I have to do uh, tomorrow, you see, is to show the advantages of doing this. And that I haven't done today, except that, uh, uh, as I pointed out, uh, this, uh, the Bergman-Russell view, um, involves uh, an ontology of uh, two kinds of objects, whereas this view pur purports, at least, to get along with only concrete. Yeah. And as I, as I indicated, I will have to show tomorrow that there's some point in, in, uh, in this uh, use, use of Occam's razor. I want to show you that we won't suffer too much uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to show you tomorrow, I hope, that, uh, that uh, uh, abstract entities come through practically unscathed. Never hurt me. Never hurt me. But they just turn out not to be quite what we think we thought they were. Uh, quite. Well, then, yeah. Yeah, now number three had to do with the Wittgenstein idea of, uh, of elementary propositions picturing. Mm -hmm. Now, it seemed to me that this was tied very much to a view of elementary propositions mm -hmm. and elementary facts. That right. is, they don't display logical structure, and mm -hmm. if they did, then that would be the wrong notation, because mm -hmm. the notation doesn't reflect the right. logical structure. So, well, you see, it seemed to me that in, in attempting to dispense with Frege's uh, predicates or the concepts, or you call them attributes, I guess, uh, th that Frege, that Wittgenstein really had two problems. One was to eliminate the, uh, the, the attributes that occur in elementary propositions, and he tried to do this by a picture theory. But then there were other attributes, say, defined by quantifications of various kinds. And he had tried to analyze these in a way by means of his possibly infinite truth functions. Yeah, well, now, I, I'm not committed to anything like that. Yeah, but I mean, I, I feel that as, an, as a logically adequate notation, you are committed to applying it only in the case of elementary. I agree, and that's, that's, the only place, that's the only place I'm applying. But do you know any elementary propositions? Well, because <laughs> I, I mean, I don't have to take any absolutely elementary propositions. In other words, this doesn't go along. In, in the case of Wittgenstein, uh, it went along with the thesis that there are absolutely simples and must be absolutely simples, and our language must be hooked up with absolutely simples. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing like that involved in this. The, the, uh, the names can hook up with what in point of fact are extremely complex objects. There's no simple connection between the hookup of a name with an object and whether it's in some profound sense simple. But again, you're looking ahead. I mean, I haven't, uh, I said during the lecture today, I'm not even saying what a name is yet. I'm just relying on intuitive things. I haven't, uh, so I, uh, all I did was to pose the problem. What is the way in which certain expressions become linguistic representatives of objects? But I certainly am not committing myself to absolute simplicity. So, one, two, three, uh, we, I think uh, uh, I've given you a straightforward answer to the uh, everything except the last one, where all I had to do was to continue 
Uh, my promissory notes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, Russell looks at ARB and he sort of seraphically abstracts to the propositional function or the, the <coughs> propositional relation to something mm -hmm. X hat RB, uh, Y hat, and he has this, this thing. I don't see really why the jumping Russell won't just go to X hat over Y hat. Now you'll say this is a confusion saying that the but that standing over is acting like relating when in fact there's nothing there. But in fact there is something there, there's style, and style is something. Something, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing. No. <laughs> there seems to be I, I mean, no reason. Everything is something. <laughs> abstract. I mean, I, then you obviously. should be able to abstract what the style is doing, what yes. is being expressed by style. Right, sure. And then you do just what Russell has, and you have once again, the relationship. As a matter of fact, it's a matter of curious that Russell, in his uh, book, got, well, in his The Analysis of Mind, uh, he gave the account, the reply to Bradley, which I described. He first of all gave it in, uh, in an essay called Propositions, which he wrote, that came out in 1918. But then he, he, he elaborated it in The Analysis of Mind. And then he wrote a book called uh, Philosophy, uh, published in this country, uh, in England, under. Uh, under uh, well, anyway, in this country, it came out under the name philosophy. And in it, he gives two accounts, one of which is the one he gave in the uh, analysis of mind, and the other is essentially this one here, according to which uh, you say that A precedes B by simply putting the name A and the name B in a certain relation. But he jumbles it up with the other, and it's quite clear that Russell never really uh, knew exactly what Wittgenstein was up to there, and then he throws it away. Uh, it never touches it again. Uh, but, uh, I mean, obviously, there are such things as styles. Remember at the very first lecture, in the very first paragraph, I said, there's a sense, of course, you know, in which there are, there are K's, is obvious, commonsensical, Unexciting. There are attributes, there are qualities, there are relations, there are styles, there are manners. Yeah, but then you said there is a, a philosophically interesting sense in which, well, there are, there are abstract entities, but there really are no abstract entities. Now that's relevant because I'm going to argue that uh, tomorrow. I'm going to be discussing exactly the difference between saying, well, of course there are styles, and saying, well, of course there are no styles. But then, uh, again, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. I haven't discussed abstract entities in my own book yet. You'll have to take that as a promissory yeah, note. Your reduction of, of relationships to styles in no way helps in your... your I haven't reduced mind. relationships to styles. Excuse me. Your, your, your reduction of relationship letters to styles in no way helps in your, your claim that, that relationship letters do not denote or styles do well, not Well, we just have to see. Because I haven't given my theory yet. I mean, what you're doing is making a bet. Now I'm making a bet. <laughs> well, okay. So well, I will make an assertion, too. Uh, uh, assertions can change, huh? Right. Well, I think, uh, actually, that's as good a point as any. I don't want to issue too many promissory notes. I mean, I'm interested that everybody is looking forward and really not back. Uh, <laughs> I sort of I would like you to feel Promethean and not have Promethean there. All good things come to an end, and this afternoon, the John Dewey Lectures of 1974 will come to an end. The best things come to an end climactically, and for the next hour or so, we'll all be sitting on the edges of our chairs, eagerly awaiting to redeem our promissory notes. <laughs> the title of this afternoon's lecture, Professor Sellers tells me, is, I better see exact words here, a debtor's program. 
<laughs> or fragments of a coherence theory of meaning. I would like uh, now to uh, say in behalf of all of us, express our appreciation to Professor Sellers uh, for the stimulating series of lectures and to thank the John Dewey Foundation for making these lectures possible. Now, I've been wondering ever since yesterday's lecture what would be the appropriate way to introduce Professor Sellers this afternoon, uh, to introduce him as the John Dewey Lecture of 1974 no longer seems appropriate since the phrase John Dewey Lecture of 1974 is a predicate and <laughs> predicates are dispensable. It would seem the appropriate way would be to pronounce the name Professor Wilfred Sellers in the appropriate style. <laughs> or failing that, to write it on the blackboard in the appropriate style, some form of jumblees maybe. <laughs> but I confess I'm at a loss as to what that style might be. And yet being uh, a victim of a philosophical disease, rather well known, I'm reluctant to uh, make unnecessary commitments. <laughs> so I've concluded that perhaps the best way to follow the example of the wise philosophers in Gulliver's Travels, <laughs> and neither to use nor even to mention the name, but simply exhibit the nominatum. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that I feel more <clears throat> at the beginning than at the end. Uh, I, uh, this is certainly, it is certainly not any feeling of conclusiveness or conclusions that uh, is haunting me at the moment, but a sense of uh, new tasks opening up in front of me. However, uh, I do, uh, I do wish to give some cash on the promissory notes I've issued, indicate the strategy for dealing with others, and uh, in general, give you some sense that, uh, that uh, uh, there is uh, gold in the particular hills that I've been mining. Now I want to begin this afternoon by some general considerations about meaning, because uh, it will be these general considerations about meaning which will lead to the account of abstract entities which I want to offer, and also it will be this account of meaning which will clear the way for what I referred to in the title as a coherence theory of meaning, or more accurately, I think, a coherence theory of representational systems. Now, let me uh, begin with my old chestnut. There's, I mean, once you get a good thing, uh, uh, you might as well stick with it because it's not always easy to break in a new horse. Take the, the statement, und in German means and. Now there are uh, two things to note about this, uh, this statement. Three things. First of all, it's true. Secondly, that the subject of this sentence is a singular term. Uh, I mean, that obviously, grammatically, it's a singular term. We have a verb here which is in the singular. So that at least at the, way up at the surface, it's uh, uh, we have here a statement beginning with a singular term, a verb in the singular, and something or other on the other end there. The second thing to be noted is that the word with which it ends is an unusual use of the word and. Uh, 
It's not serving as a sentential connective. I mean, the, the basic job of the word and is to connect two sentences, making a bigger one out of two little ones. For example, Tom is tall and uh, Tom is wise. Out of the two sentences, Tom is tall, Tom is wise. Uh, so let me take up these points in order. Many philosophers have succumbed to the temptation to construe the subject of this statement as the name of a linguistic abstract entity, the German word und uh, as a universal, which can and does have many instances, the sort of picture being, well, here's the universal like triangularity, which has many instances. Uh, they all share in, partake of, exemplify it. And then we have the German word und, uh, and uh, it has many instances, uh, just as many triangles or instances of that. So in German language and literature, you find many scattered instances of this universal. That is one way of looking at it. Um, yet this is a mistake, and it has many uh, repercussions, uh, I think, and cause a great deal of damage. There are indeed many uns in German language and literature, and they are indeed instances of a certain kind, und kind, we might call it, but that's not what this statement is talking about. This statement is not talking about und kind. Um, it is uh, making a, an unusual, uh, not easily recognizable use of the word, but once we get familiar with it, it will, uh, be, it will turn out to be something that occurs constantly. For example, there are also many lions, and they are instances of lion kind. There is such a thing as lion kind, of course. But it is important to distinguish between two singular terms which are in the neighborhood of the sortal particate lion. There is, the, in the first place, the singular term which belongs in the context uh, is a non-empty class. For example, lion kind is a non-empty class. Ordinary language has no neat expression which does this job. The phrase, the class of lions, will do. I could say lion kind. But there are also such terms as the lion or a lion or any lion. We could say the lion is tawny, a lion is tawny, any lion is tawny. Uh, and these are all roughly equivalent in meaning to all lions are tawny. Each of these expressions in a standard use in such sentences as has conversational implicatures, some of which are relevant to the linguistic exam examples I shall shortly be giving. Now, I call such uh, singular terms as the lion or a lion or any lion distributive terms or distributive singular terms. Now, notice that I'm not saying that all expressions of the form the K, which are not definite descriptions of an individual K, are distributive singular terms. Thus, in the lion once roamed the western plains, the subject is not a DST. For although its sense is roughly equivalent to lions once roamed the western plains, it is not even remotely equivalent to all lions once roamed the western plain. But there are contexts in which the phrase the lion uh, does serve as a distributive singular term. And uh, one of those terms, the lion or a lion or any lion, does uh, have as a core of its meaning, all lions are tawny. But again, with some implicatures, which, uh, which are indeed relevant, but which will be beyond our, uh, beyond our scope today, because I'm not going to be concerned, uh, I don't have the time uh, or the energy to be concerned with normative issues, and yet normative issues pertaining to language ultimately have to come to the center of the stage. There are so many things that I simply cannot even mention because to mention them is uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to raise specters. So the correct interpretation I'm going to argue of this is uh, one which treats the und here not as, as it were, the name of an, of, a, of an abstract singular entity, but as really uh, a distributive singular term, it's short for the unt or an unt uh, or any unt. So we have here then uh, 
a sentence which is in the singular, but with one of the, with, with, you can choose one of those, with one of these singular terms, which is not, uh, uh, which is not a name of a universal and still provides us with a way of talking about all uns. You see, there are two ways then. You can talk about all uns by climbing up the semantic ladder or the ontological ladder, if you prefer, and talking about unt kind and its instances. That's a good Germanic way of doing it. Unt kind and its instances. Or you can simply say, any unt in German means or. Now, of course, the, the virtue of the unt is that it carries with it connotations, you might say, of normalcy. Because, I mean, there are unts in German which occur in all kinds of strange ways, might even occur in a sand dune and that sort of thing. So that when we say the lion is tawny, you know, we know there's some scruffy lions which are pale green and so on. There's some kind of disease and so on. So that the word the carries with it, as I said, these overtones, which, uh, which as it were, cut down to a reference uh, to, you might say, normal standard instances. And that's why it's better than an unt or any unt, because any unt, any old unt won't do, really. So I will then put this as the unt in German means an. And this is, according to the interpretation I've been placing upon this, strongly equivalent to, with those footnotes, uh, uns. Put an S after the quotation here. Uns in German mean, and now we move to the plural, mean and. Well, so much for the left-hand side of our statement, although it is using, in, in, in discussing it, I've been using concepts that are going to turn out to be of the very essence uh, of ontological issues uh, pertaining to abstract entities. Now, the second point to be noted about that statement was that it involved an atypical use of the word and. For the word and is not functioning, as I said, as a sentential connective. Now, a natural move is to construe the context as a quoting one. Und in German means and. Uh, and uh, to construe it then as uh, uh, referring to the English word and in the way in which the German word is being referred to there. Uh, but quoting contexts are often such that to leave them unchanged while adding quotes to the quoted item changes the sense. Uh, or rather, ordinary contexts are often such that to leave them unchanged but to add quotes is to change the sense. And it is clear that three doesn't merely tell us, that this item here doesn't merely tell us that unt and and have the same meaning. There's a very important sense in which it presents the meaning, it gives us the meaning. Uh, you can say of two expressions, say one in Turkish and one in Greek, that they mean the same, or you're mentioning each expression, and yet you won't have explained to somebody who doesn't know those languages uh, any meaning. And the important thing about a meaning statement, its very essence, as we will see, is that it, it does, in a sense, explain the meaning of a word. It does so in a unique kind of way. So it gives us the meaning, and uh, how does it do it? Well, one way of putting it is to say that it presents us uh, with an example of uh, something in our own background language which functions in the way in which the German word und functions. This means then that having a background language, as we all do in these days, uh, having a background language containing the word and, what you do is you rehearse in imagination how the word and functions. You run through De Morgan a bit and all that sort of thing, and you know that it's connective, builds up big ones out of little ones. You rehearse its use, and therefore you understand then how the German word und is functioning. It gives you the meaning, but it gives you it in the form of a do-it-yourself kit. 
It doesn't describe the meaning. It doesn't spell out the meaning. It doesn't spell out the function. What it does is to give it to you in a unique kind of way. Now, the way I have interpreted this is as follows. That the Unt in, uh, that Unt's in German uh, mean and is that this unusual use of the expression is really in a special way a quoting expression. In the following sense, that what it does is to, is to form, we form a sortal out of this word, which is a functional classifier. And uh, the word and with these dot quotes, which uh, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with, the dot quotes gives us a sortal, and we interpret the word means as a form of the copula. So we say, once in German are ands. Now what's going on here? This is a crucial move in the theory of meaning, because uh, instead of a supposed uh, a relation of meaning, which we seem to have, because the initial statement had the form x, r, y, it looked like meaning is a relation, and we get relational theories of meaning generated by the surface grammar of this statement. Uh, its depth grammar, as I see it, is a classificatory statement. The word and here is a sort of which applies to any expression in our own language or in another language, which does the job uh, which uh, we can, uh, we can uh, discover by simply rehearsing this word. This word is a word, then it is in our own background language. We can rehearse that word, and then we discover the functioning of, uh, of items that are to be, uh, that are appropriately classified by that, uh, by that sort of. So that when we say that uns in German are ands, we are classifying uns in German as falling under this sortal. And the criteria for falling under the sortal are the functionings that we discover by rehearsing our own background use. Meaning always comes back to one's own background language. Now, uh, the, uh, the important feature, however, is that we have replaced the word mean by R. Because I take it now that it's clear that the word R, the copula R, does not stand for a relation. And so if this analysis of the depth grammar of a meaning statement is correct, then uh, meaning simply is not a relation because uh, it's, uh, it's a specialized form of the copula. Uh, we find other specialized forms of the copula we could say in, uh, in Texas chess, and use an example I've used elsewhere, in Texas chess, uh, Cadillac, the Cadillac plays the king. And uh, play, uh, so we, have, we can have playing as a, as, a, as a copula in a special form of, uh, uh, as a special form of classifier. So that uh, to be a, a dot quote and is to be an item in any language which functions as and does in our language. Uh, and I call sortals of that kind illustrating sortals. Now it's very important to note that it's an oversimplification to speak of the function of a certain expression in a given language. Classifications are always relative uh, to a purpose. Various devices can be used to make it clear which functions of the word, which is used to form an illustrating sortal, are serving as criteria. Uh, as was pointed out, all, as I pointed out before, uh, these illustrating sortals are, because they are sortals, um, tied to criteria, and these criteria can be flexible. They can be looser or tighter. Uh, let's take an example for a, a, a consider, for example, the, uh, the German word odor. Uh, we could say odors. in German are or, are ors. But now the question is, what is it to be an or? Are you going to pin it down to the, um, to the, uh, uh, the weak sense of or or to the strong sense of or? Uh, so that, uh, uh, in other words, uh, uh, supposing that the Germans uh, uh, always use the word or in the in the strict sense, uh, the, the, the exclusive sense, you see. Well, 
we, we, we might or might not, might not, depending on the context, be willing to classify it for our present purposes as an or. We might, be, we might insist upon putting some qualification on it, that they are a strict ors or something like that. Uh, the point is then that once you recognize that the word over here is functioning as a sorbo, you can take into account likeness of meaning, in other words, likeness of function. In order for something uh, to be an or, it needn't be exactly like our or. On the other hand, if, uh, if you're doing some very precise uh, syntactical or logical analysis, it may be of the essence that in order for something to be an or, it's got to function exactly like or does in our particular background. So that, as I said, a provision for likeness of meaning is built into this interpretation of meaning statements. So meaning is not a relation and a provision for likeness of function is built in. And as I said, the flexibility uh, is built in there as we would want it to be. Uh, all right. Now, notice that when I talk about uns in German mean uh, an, and oders in German mean or, uh, or that uns in German are and, the <coughs> what I'm saying is that uh, uh, I'm not claiming, you see, to have solved problems about translation here. Uh, the, the point is that I'm giving an analysis of what the meaning statement is, but now to determine that uns in German do function as an does in our background language, or that oder in German does function as or does in our background language, um, to determine that is a matter of empirical research. You would actually have to uh, under you have to undertake the kind of enterprise uh, that uh, Coyne, for example, has been undertaking. Uh, and uh, it is not my purpose here to comment on the way in which I think he ties his hands behind his back, but uh, uh, I'm assuming, you see now, that we are able, that there is in principle some way of determining whether or not once in German do function in a certain way, in a way which is parallel with that linguistic material uh, to the way in which ands function in our background language. So when I say that anything is, a, is an or which functions in, it, in its language, as does uh, odor in, uh, anything is an or which functions in its language as or does in ours, well, of course, that may be vacuous. I mean, there might be no other language in which, in a relevant way, or does function. The, there is a word which functions as our word or does. This is an analysis of the meaning, of the meaning statement itself. All right, well now, uh, the, the first point I want to make then is that uh, we have a simple meaning statement construed as a non-relational statement. Now, this is not, and I mean, this is actually not uh, the kind of meaning statement that is of a particular interest to us, although it does contain the germ of a whole theory of meaning. What tends to interest us more are statements of the following kind. Uh, let's say uh, triangular. Well, let's take the German. I could use examples, and I will later on, from, uh, from our own language. But the fundamental philosophical points uh, are best made by looking at uh, this kind of example. Dreieckig, in German, stands for yeah, I could have gone through the same routine, Dreieck in German means triangular, but I can also say that it stands for triangularity. And here is where we begin to make contact with the problem of abstract entities. Dreieck in German stands for triangularity. Now, once again, we have a statement that looks as though it had the relational form, X, R, Y. So we tend to think that we have here a relation, we're talking about a relation in which uh, a certain German word uh, stands to a certain entity, triangularity. Now, it's certainly true that Dreieck in German does stand for triangularity. There's no, no argument about that. The problem is what the significance of it is, what ontological commitments we're buying into, and in general, what is, it, what is, what is its philosophical payoff. 
Now again, the first move we make is to treat this as a distributive singular term. The Dreieckig in German stands for triangularity. Then we go from there to Dreieckig. Dreieckigs in German uh, stand for triangularity. And now what are we going to do about the right hand side? Well, the first, thing, the first thing I'm going to say is the heart of the matter, and it's the thesis I want to defend. And that is that uh, the word triangularity, although it looks like a name, and it looks like a name standing for a non-linguistic abstract object, actually doesn't do so at all. So according to surface grammar, the following seem to be the case. Triangularity is a name, it refers to a non-linguistic entity, and stands for is a relation which uh, holds between a linguistic and a non-linguistic entity. Now, uh, I'm going to say that none of that is the case, and that in no way are we committed to an, a platonic ontology if we accept that statement uh, and keep it in our active uh, uh, functioning vocabulary instead of uh, regimenting it out of the existence. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is to treat triangularity as a distributive singular term. I mean, what we are used to by now, I mean, you can find them everywhere, is distributive term, distributive singular terms at the subject side of statements. Like, you know, the lion is tawny, the elephant is uh, endowed with a long memory, etc., etc. Uh, but now, what I'm suggesting is that we also find distributive singular terms occurring at the predicate end. Now, uh, consider the following sentence. Uh, you have to scrabble around to find good examples of this in ordinary, uh, in ordinary language. But consider this, the pub is the poor man's club. I mean, that's the kind of locution we use. The pub is the, pure, the poor man's club. Now, there are two interesting things about that. In the first place, it obviously does have two distributive singular terms in it. The second is that it has a copula in it, exactly where I'm going to want a copula to be in a few minutes. So we have the pub is the poor man's club. Now, obviously what I'm going to do is to hook up stands for uh, with is. I'm going to hook up the poor man's club with triangularity, and really the poor man, we could say, what I'm going to argue is that the dryakig is the German, is the German, uh, and now I'm going to use a distributive singular term formed from exactly the, by the, exactly the same device I used in the case of or and and, dot quotes. The dryakic is the German dot for, quote, uh, triangular. The dryakic is the German dot, quote, triangular. The pub is the poor man's club. Now, what is the importance of this? Once again, the key importance is that if this analysis is correct, stands for is a pseudo-relation. It isn't a relation at all. It's really a disguised form of the copula. And furthermore, if this analysis is correct, triangularity is not a name, it's a singular term. It's masquerading as a name, but it's a singular term. And uh, it, uh, we have here then another way of saying the same thing that we said before, as we could say if we said dreieckig in German means triangular. Now this, uh, and our analysis comes down to dreieckigs, I'll just abbreviate that there, dreieckigs in German are dot quote uh, triangulars. In other words, to be a dot quote triangular is to be an expression in any language 
which does the job which is done in our background language by the word triangular. What is that? Well, if you rehearse it, you know, remember uh, so, uh, roughly some of the uh, some of the principles, which are some of the generalities in which the word triangular occurs. Uh, something is triangular even only if it has three sides, uh, uh, straight sides, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Plain figure bounded by three straight lines and so on. So we can rehearse, uh, you might say, elementary uh, geometry insofar as it involves the word triangular, get some feeling for how the word functions there. And then we know that dreieckig in German functions in that way. So dreieckig in German means triangular, uh, is a class functional classification. I call this the theory of meaning as functional classification. We say here then, this boils down to that. Now the interesting thing is that this boils down to exactly the same thing. That at the bottom level, I could go from the pub is the poor man's club to pubs are poor men's clubs. And I can go from the dreieckig in German stands for triangularity, the dreieckig is the German triangular to dreieckigs uh, in German are triangulars. Now, one of the interesting questions that immediately arises is, <coughs> well, if these two statements, dreieckig in German means triangular, and dreieckig in German stands for triangularity, if these two statements come to the same thing, why are there two of them? What's the point of there being two of them? And therein uh, uh, hangs the tail. The crucial thing about triangularity is that it occurs in two kinds of context. It occurs in a stands for context, but it occurs in another kind of context. And it's uh, the fact that it is prepared to stand in that other context, which makes there be a point to have this way of saying the same thing that is said by that. Now, what is the other context in which the word triangularity occurs? It occurs in such a statement as A exemplifies triangularity. So we have two contexts, meaning context, truth context, because this turns out to be a truth context. All right, now suppose that I'm right about this analysis of the depth grammar of a stands for statement. I can, I can give and will give exactly the same analysis for uh, a set standing for a proposition, you see. Uh, propositions will come in in the same way. Uh, uh, but let's take the, the case of triangularity first. A exemplifies triangularity. Well, according to the analysis I'm offering, uh, uh, triangularity equals the dot quote triangular. It's a singular term focusing attention on this sort of. Now, it's important for our purposes to see that, uh, with a sort of Fragian insight here, that the important, and as we would expect from our discussion of predicates last time, and remember, after, after indicating that the role performed by predicates is dispensable in principle, you see, I pointed out, of course, that in point of fact, it is absolutely indispensable. Uh, it's only philosophically perspicuous uh, to use John Blaise. It is not in any way helpful to anyone working with symbolism uh, uh, to use jump leads. So what I'm going to do now in this context here is to treat this as A exemplifies. Uh, I'm going to treat triangularity as the triangular in the first instance. But then what I'm going to do is to uh, make it into the X is triangular. Now, there are technicalities here in the way of how this should be formalized, which are, for my present purposes, irrelevant. Um, so A exemplifies triangularity. Well, triangularity is the triangular, but we might say, for our purposes, it's the blank is triangular. 
And then what this becomes is the x is triangular is true of A. So the first move I'm going to make then is to analyze triangularity as a distributive singular term. Then I'm going to analyze exemplifies in terms of the concept of truth. Now this sort of, this rings true to anybody who's really pondered about exemplifies because we do a point of fact uh, 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 when we do philosophy often, uh, uh, speak of uh, triangularities being true of something uh, as being roughly equivalent to uh, it exemplifies triangularity. But I think this is the philosophically crucial move to make, that that's exactly what exemplifies is doing. It's a special form of truth party. All right, so the x is triangular is true of A, and I analyze this still further as the x is triangular is true when the x, when we have an A, some expression doing the job done by A here is uh, put in for the x. So that this comes down to the dot quote A is triangular is true. And of course, as you all know, a is triangular is true if and only if A is triangular. And so uh, the philosophical fruit of this strategy is that instead of exemplifies being a funny kind of tie or nexus between concreta and an abstract entity triangular, it turns out that exemplifies is just a surrogate for the word true. And uh, I'm not going to uh, be able to give a theory of truth here this afternoon. I, I have far too many other things to discuss, but I do want you to see the philosophical significance of the thesis and how, it, how the strategy fits in with the overall strategy I've been using. So A exemplifies triangularity becomes the X is triangular is true with A for X and that is equivalent to the A is triangular is true and that's equivalent to A is triangular. So that uh, if you don't think that truth is a relation in the war between things and language, uh, then this would satisfy you that exemplification is not a relation. Now, as I said, it would take a full account of truth in order to explore in what sense, if any, truth is or isn't relational. And I find that to be one of the $64,000 questions in, in philosophy. But sufficient uh, for the, this afternoon's purposes if I have persuaded you uh, that this strategy is plausible, and if I have to give you another promissory note at this moment, and that's the way it is. That's the way it is. I, a theory of truth, which would come out with the full cash of this, I think, is something that I can only leave as a promissory note. But then I can discuss that in the question period. All right, then. I'm suggesting in general that so-called nominalizing devices, which when added to expressions, form corresponding uh, abstract singular terms, itty, hood, ness, uh, si, shun, and even that. For example, we have, uh, we could I could take, for example, the uh, uh, Socrates, uh, is time philosoph in German stands for the proposition that Socrates is a philosopher. And I can go through exactly the same uh, processes here. Uh, and then I could talk about the proposition being actualized, proposition being a state of affairs, being actualized, and turn that again into a form of truth, because I think that it, turn, it turns out that there's a whole set of, uh, of truth particles, uh, which, uh, uh, which belong together and function in interestingly different ways. There's, uh, there's true, there's exemplifies. In the case of event language, there's occurs. I think it'll turn out that occurs. Is a, form of the, uh, is, a, is a form of truth predicate. 
And uh, uh, I think his actual is another case of, uh, of a truth predicate. So there are many interesting, philosoph philosophically interesting uh, expressions which turn out to be variations on the word true and take one directly into a theory of truth. So I want to say then that these, um, these devices, idiot ness and so on, are to be construed as quoting devices which form metalinguistic functional sortals and turn them into distributive singular terms. And it is this step of turning, uh, say, turning triangular into a distributive singular term by itty, it is that which creates the semblance of a name and leads one to suppose, you see, that triangularity is an object. Now, okay, let me <coughs> pause for a moment to pick up a, a promissory note that I scattered around. Is there really such a thing as triangularity? Of course there is. Yeah, but what is it? It's a distributive object. It isn't, a, see, the basic notion of an object goes with the notion of a name. An object, roughly, is something that is named. Now, take the, the phrase of the average man. Now, that's a, an expression of a different kind. I haven't discussed that at all, but I'm sure you're all uh, familiar with some account that would be given of the average man. Is there such a thing as the average man? Well, you'd say, yeah, of course there is. You say, is there really such a thing as the average man? Uh, well, you'd say, I suppose not, because you could paraphrase, you could paraphrase statements about the average man away into statements of such and such a kind with a little mathematics thrown in. So the notion of what there really is, as opposed to what there is, is tied up with the notion of what is paraphrasable away into more basic kinds of talk. Now, there really are abstract entities. There really, there really is such a thing as triangularity in the ordinary sense of really. Of course there is triangularity. But in the philosophically interesting sense of really, there is no such thing as triangularity because it is a distributive object. It's a distributive object. By that, I mean it's an object, statements about which you can paraphrase away by talking about inscriptions and tokens uh, and uh, conceptual tokens. I haven't discussed philosophy of mind here, you know this at all. I've been simply talking in terms of language. But I would want to include conceptual tokens as well as overt linguistic tokens of the word triangular. So when you talk about triangularity, you're indeed talking about something, but you're not talking about an object by itself. It's a simply a way of distributively talking about all conceptual tokens of a certain word. All conceptual tokens, more accurately, which are doing a certain function in, in uh, English by the word triangular, in German by the word dryity, and in Mentalese by a Mentalese word which uh, uh, you'll have to uh, cook up in your own mind at the present moment because it can't be uttered. All right. Therefore, I'm saying that triangularity merely looks to the eye bewitched by a certain picture to be a name. It merely looks as though it referred to, do, uh, to something non-linguistic. Applying to expressions in any language which do a certain job, its interlinguistic reference is confused with a non-linguistic reference. Again, stands for merely seems to stand for a relation. It is, as means proved to be, if I am right, a specialized form of the copula. Well, now, this is the general framework of a theory of meaning which I now want to apply. The above account of meaning, of meaning statements actually, as giving functional classifications by a special use of expressions in our background language, explains how these statements can bewitch the mind about the nature of meaning. For meaning statements, by their nature, focus attention on functional equivalence of expressions. In other words, dryache and triangular and so on. They, uh, every, the very nature of meanings and stands for statements is to focus attention on expressions which are functionally equivalent. And that, that's what leads to the central role of syn the problem of synonymy in classical theories of meaning. Uh, meaning statements do not tell us how an expression functions except indirectly by presenting us with another expression in our background language with the functioning of which we are presumably familiar and leaves us with the task of figuring out this function by rehearsing its use in our imagination. 
Furthermore, meaning statements are easily misinterpreted as actually telling us the function of expressions. Take, for example, expression means thus and so, or expression stands for thus and so. Um, uh, th these can be interpreted as telling us that the expressions have the function of meaning or the function of standing for something. That's the function of words you've heard many a time. The function of words is to stand for something, is to mean something. Well, you see, stand for and uh, means are not functions at all. They're simply the copula. They're pseudo-functions. The, to find out what the functions of words is, you have to do the dirty work of seeing how they actually hook up with other expressions uh, in a language and do a certain kind of job. As I said, there is no such thing as the function of meaning or of standing for, and uh, therefore, in traditional theories of meaning, uh, uh, the notion that there is such a function has blinded people to the, gen gen uh, the genuine functions which it is the role of meaning statements to convey. Now, leaving aside the illocutionary and perlocutionary functions of language, and concentrating on the functions whereby language contains an apparatus for representing extralinguistic reality, uh, those to be stressed are the ones which concern the ways in which expressions occur in rule-governed patterns involved in acquiring and developing a linguistic representation of the world. Or what we might call, since if we were, not, if we were talking about philosophy of mind, and not about language, we could talk about uh, the way of forming an inner representation of the world, which is analogous to the kind of representation of the world that we get in language. See, that as for my, my, my thesis is that the central concept in the theory of meaning is the concept of language as enabling us to form a representational system, and crudely, as I will say in a moment, a map of the world. It is the concept of such a linguistic representation which is the key to the meaning or function of the various kinds of empirical uh, expressions. Thus, the one-one equivalences of classical meaning theory, and as a matter of fact, the logic of co-referential expressions, takes the eye away from the holistic character of empirical meaning, the role of coherence and interdependence. A simple but not too oversimplified example will serve to make these ideas more intuitive. How does one explain the meaning of the word triangle, perhaps, uh, to a child who does not know how to use it? Obviously, if it is already at home in geometrical language, one way is by doing something like giving a definition. I say something like giving a definition because uh, since the theory of language with which we're working, as should be clear now, has no commitment whatever to what Quine calls the myth of the museum, what I call the myth of the given, nor to the contemplation of ideas or essences and so on and so forth, we can take the clumsiness and rough edges of nat natural languages for granted. This theory of meaning with all its flexibility involves no commitment to uh, uh, to, as I say, the classical theories of meanings as objects, and meanings as tidy objects, and meanings as private or public, or et cetera, et cetera. Natural languages can be taken in the way in which they function in, with all their, all their warts. Uh, language is a Heraclitean business. It is the job of philosophers uh, and uh, theoreticians in linguistics to find tidy ways of, uh, of exploring uh, this flux, this Heraclitean flux. Uh, and, uh, for example, uh, linguists find it useful to use concepts like predicate and sentence and uh, uh, determiner and so on. Uh, and I think we can also even say that from our standpoint of philosophy, once we realize that we're not making any, as it were, Platonistic commitment, we can actually use such words as definition and, uh, and other expressions of this kind without uh, tying ourselves uh, to a tradition uh, which is violently attacked by some people. I think the issue doesn't exist, you see, that's the trouble. It just seems, it just doesn't, it falls away completely when you have this kind of approach to meaning. So as I say, one way of explaining the meaning of the word triangle is by finding an expression which is, to a high degree, functionally equivalent. Just for old time's sake, nostalgia, 
Let us assume that we can use triangle means plane figure by bounded by three straight lines, the classic. Now the process of finding strings of expressions which are functionally equivalent with the expressions we're trying to explain obviously has its limitations. First place, a child may not be in the into linguistic, into geometrical language at all. Sooner or later, in any case, we come to words which it is difficult or impossible to explain in that way. Thus, when it comes to point, line, etc., one explains their meaning by showing how these words function in certain general sentences belonging to elementary geometrical theory. We could say certain general sentences which are assented to by the community at large if you wanted to use a certain terminology. Of course, one also teaches the child to respond to examples. But the examples, of course, do not generate these general sentences by their mere presence. And it is only after a child has acquired higher order linguistic skills that it is in a position to engage in the enterprise of induction and hypothetical deductive reasoning. Quine's uh, children seem to have used induction at a very early age uh, uh, in their learning of language. Uh, now the feature of those general sentences I want to stress is that they do not have the form of equivalences. They are not of the, in these basic geometrical sentences, which are generally accepted in the community. Uh, they are not of the form bachelors or unmarried males. Bachelors or unmarried men. Uh, gen uh, general sentences of the kind we are interested in um, serve the purpose which is served in sophisticated discourse by law-like statements. They are applied to new cases and generate subjunctive conditionals and counterfactuals, as I see it, the key feature of law-like statements is their connection with subjunctive conditionals and counterfactuals. Thus, I suggest that once we get away from the functional equivalences highlighted by meaning statements and look at the actual functioning of empirical expressions in C2, we see that to describe their functions is to discuss the role of empirical expressions in perceptual reports, in inferences, and as I shall shortly emphasize, in cognitively oriented action. For example, one hasn't fully caught on to the functioning of even the word red, unless one is not only prepared to respond to a red object with gavagai, excuse me, in standard conditions with this is red, but is prepared to, uh, do, to uh, make such inferences as this is red, so it is not green. That's part of the logical space of that predicate. And it's part of its meaning. Not part of its meaning in the sense that it belongs in a simple functional equivalence. You see, that X is red isn't functionally equivalent with X is not green. Or even with X is a not, uh, not any member of a disjunction of orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and so on. But the point is that when you look at the actual functioning, is what, where is where meaning really is, the actual functioning involves the inference, uh, inferences of this kind. Or for example, this is red, so it is extended. And that's why I speak now of a coherence theory of meaning where the functioning now is what I'm concentrating on, having gotten away from meaning as being a relation here. I'm talking about the functionings of, in this case, the predicate red. Or, uh, uh, to take another example and of somewhat greater importance for our purposes, it is an essential part of the job of certain predicates, thus thing-kind predicates, that they figure essentially in inferences authorized by law-like statements. For example, this needle is magnetized, so it points north. Let me sum this up by saying that the meaning or function of empirical predicates is in part to be caught up in a system of inference patterns only some of which, the least interesting, express functional equivalences of the kind stressed by traditional theories of meaning with its, uh, uh, with its uh, quest for synonymy. Far, uh, far more important are the logically synthetic patterns which reflect the acceptance of law-like statements. Now, on account of the representative function, the representational function of referring expressions, I've been discussing predicates, must, and therefore indirectly discussing sentences in which predicates are doing their, making their particular contribution to the character of the sentence. Uh, but now turning to referring expressions, 
a, an account of the representational function of referring expressions must also begin by pointing out the dangers of the equivalence models of semantical accounts of meaning and reference. For example, Parigi in Italian means Paris. Socrates denotes the teacher of Plato. Boom, boom. Uh, it looks like a one-to-one -one business. Names, demonstratives, and descriptions have quite different types of function. But each of them contributes in its way to the notion of, rep of a representational system. And these functions are by no means independent of one another. And they are not to be understood in terms of a piecemeal one-one connection between expressions and objects. This is obvious in the case of descriptive phrases, and it should be no less obvious in the case of here, now, and this, even. Perhaps it will be most useful, therefore, to consider the function of names. The strategy suggested by the equivalence model is to seek to understand the semantical role of a name in terms of a functional equivalence of the name to a definite description or a cluster of definite descriptions. And there's undoubtedly some degree of functional equivalence to be found, which keeps people on the search. But consider the case, now this is an analogy, a rather remote analogy, but it will make the point. Consider the case of the origin of a system of coordinates. Point A. Consider other points in there. There is a high degree of functional equivalence between uh, the origin O, the name there, O, and uh, such descriptions as the point which is three inches below uh, and two inches to the left of A, or having other points, the point which is five inches to the right and uh, four inches to the left, uh, uh, to the below A, and so on. But it is obvious that O uh, has a function which is not constituted by such functional equivalences. Now, names of objects, as I see it, have a function which, is which uh, like that of the um, origin of a coordinate system, is to be a fixed center of reference, a peg, so to speak, on which to hang descriptions. Uh, to use a different uh, metaphor, which I think is actually more useful, uh, names can be said to be fixed points, but they are floating on the descriptions they support. Uh, it's a kind of mutual relationship, because when I say fixed, a fixed point of reference, I do not mean that a system of names is immune to revision. So I think of, there is a function that names have which is distinctive. It is it is a function to be, a, as it were, a fixed point of reference on which you hang descriptions, but it's not independent of them. It's, as I say, it kind of floats on a system of descriptions. And as I said, names can be abandoned and your whole coordinate system, because I do think that names are like little uh, origins of coordinates. They can be compared to them. Uh, and they function that way in a representational system. Uh, now, nothing indeed in a representational system is in principle immune to revision, unless it is the purely formal logical truths which themselves make no representational commitments. In practice, of course, at any given stage, some attempts at revision are absurd. So the concept that they're all in principle capable of revision is a, a fairly vacuous one. Now, the obvious analogy to use in developing the idea of a representational system is that of a map, and I shall not refrain. But while I shall be using this analogy to throw light on the representational features of a language, I shall obviously not be stressing the fact that maps often look quite like the terrain which they map. As I've already indicated, the representational features of a language in use, the qualification is essential, require the existence in this language of what might be called a schematic world story a story which is as much in process as the language itself and, of course, the world itself. Now, the language permits the formulation, of course, of many stories in the sense of fictions. But such stories differ from what I'm calling the world story. And you should notice, of course, that this is all a social phenomenon. I'm, I certainly am not intending to present here any Robinson Crusoe account of the functioning of language. Uh, Although, when I have discussed the world story, I've done it in terms of individuals. There was a character, it was first came in with Omniscient Jones a long, long time ago, 
and world stories have since been connected with uh, the super inscriber and things like that. You'll meet him in a moment. Uh, but uh, although I put it in terms of individuals, I clearly uh, would insist upon the social character of, uh, of language and of, the, uh, and, uh, and of knowledge and the discovery uh, of how the world is um, in general. So the language does uh, permit the formulation of many fictions, but they differ from the world story in that they are bracketed to use Husserl's term, and after all, Husserl's bracketing is exactly the sort of thing I'm talking about here, because by bracketing here, I mean by a bracketing by what might be called the once upon a time rubric. Now, what is the point of the once upon a time rubric? It cuts uh, these fictions off from practice. It cuts them off from what would otherwise, otherwise be their normal connection with observation, prediction, and action. If one is going to compare a world story with a map, the above points to the relevance of the distinction between real maps and fictional maps. To tip my hand, one doesn't go places with the map of Hobbitland. Now, the first point to which all this is leading is that what I'm going to offer is not so much an account of a world story which construes it as a large map, but rather an account which construes ordinary maps as limited and fragmentary parts of the world story. I think, however, that a clear understanding of what maps do illuminates the role of what a world story does in the representational functioning of a language. Thus, a map should be looked on as a system of logically elementary sentences, not, of course, elementary in Wittgenstein's absolute sense. Chicago is an object, but it certainly is not absolutely simple. Actually, it's better to look at a map as a, at a, map as a matrix from which we can carve out such sentences. The, these elementary sentences translate into English, for example, according to a straightforward translation manual. Thus, a dot in a certain place is the map's name for Chicago, as it thoughtfully indicates by having the word Chicago next to it. But of course, that dot is the real map's name of Chicago. It's just helping us to be able to, to learn to read the map uh, uh, to put the word Chicago in there. And there are many little cities, you know, poop, 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 that they're there, and they have map names, but then you have to work a little harder to find out how those map names uh, translate into English. Uh, I will not bore you with the obvious details as to what translates into what. The crucial thing to get straight is about is that there is a preferred direction of translation, just as there's a preferred direction of translation for a code. A code is a parasite, but so is a map. But the difference is significant. For as pointed out above, the map contains names, and it also contains uh, items which can be read as sentences. The vocabulary of the map is limited but important. It does not include, however, connectives, quantifiers, modalities, it does contain names and it does contain sentences. It doesn't contain descriptions, but it generates them very easily because of its coordinate character. Thus, the highway which is 80 miles south of Chicago is not the translation of any symbol on the map, but one who can read the map and understand it, it uh, that would trip off the tongue. Obviously, the map is not a mere list of names. The dots, lines, blue patches, arrangements, and so on are the essence of the matter. Thus, the dot which represents Chicago, say, consists of three circles, three big ones. And by virtue of this fact is the translation of Chicago is a large city. It is clear that this map is a Jumblies dialect. Maps are Jumblies dialects of English, and German maps are Jumblies dialects of German. Although, in, a certain, res in certain respect, then, the symbolic aspects of a map are like a code, one key difference is that a map in, in certain respects resembles features which the map represents. It is important to understand, therefore, that the map does not represent the terrain by virtue of similarity, but by virtue of translation into geometrical, geometric, geographical sentences, though it could not be called a map, of course, unless such resemblances could be discerned and put to use by one who knows how to read it. I pointed out a moment ago that the vocabulary 
of the map is extremely limited, lacking, for example, logical connectives. It is more important to note that it lacks words for actions. Thus, uh, although a map is for use in traveling, it does not contain map words for to go, to turn, and so on. Thus, even if it tells us that Chicago is north of Urbana, it is only in the language to which we translate that we can get the following, going north from Urbana is going toward Chicago. If I am in Urbana and want to get to Chicago, I should go north on route such and such. Now, in a certain sense, this is just what maps are for. You don't actually have to use them to go places, to the places they represent. But the point of a map seems to be to translate in a way which fits practical discourse about getting from point A to point B. I am here. Here is Urbana. Chicago is north from Urbana on route such and such. This is route such and such. I will get to Chicago to satisfy certain other conditions. If and only if I go north on that road, I will go north on that road. To which might be added, Chicago is a large city. Being in Chicago is being in a large city. Given where I am, I will be in Chicago tonight, if and only if uh, uh, I take this road. Would that I uh, were in a large city. Uh, would that I were in uh, Chicago, and so on. So that we, we maps can be tied immediately to practical discourse concerning action. Thus, there is a point of view, uh, from the point of view of practical uh, reasoning, there's a connection between the symbol for Chicago and Chicago, and symbols for large cities and large cities. Roughly, maps get you to Chicago, and they get you to large cities. And there's a connection between the fact that large cities have suburbs and the fact that a map, a map maker would draw on a symbol for a suburb near the symbol for a large city even if he had no direct information to the effect that there was uh, such a suburb. Now, this reference to constructing a map leads me back to the theme of constructing a world story. And after much cudgeling of brains, I can find no other way of getting the point across as clearly and compactly as I did in my essay on truth and correspondence, which was an earlier attempt to explicate the concept of a used language as containing a world story. And here is uh, our friend, the superinscriber. And uh, uh, a little uh, presentation of what the superinscriber does will indicate what I see to be the way in which the functioning of language ties in with forming a representational system uh, or map of the world. All right, let's suppose that observation reports have the forms illustrated by this here now is green, this is one step to the right of that, this is one heartbeat after that. This is a very crude kind of way of structuring uh, one's picture of the world in terms of heartbeats for the time and in terms of steps to the right and to the left uh, for space. But that's what our, so he's limited to that. Let us imagine a superinscriber who, quote, speaks by inscribing statements in wax and is capable of inscribing inscriptions at a fantastic rate. Indefinitely many at once, you know, like an octopus. It must not be forgotten, however, that he's a thinker as well as an inscriber and thinks far more thoughts than he expresses by inscriptions. He just puts his map, as it were, his story of the world and on the wax. All the rest of the machinery he keeps behind. Now, whenever the inscriber sees that a certain object in front of him is green or one step to the right of or to the left of another or experiences that one happening is a heartbeat later than another, he makes the corresponding inscription. We must also imagine, as we've already done already, that the inscriber has a system of coordinates metrically organized in terms of steps and heartbeats, and that he knows how to measure and count. And we shall suppose that he uses a coordinate language in which names are ordered set of numerals, three for space, one for time, which are assigned to events on the basis of measurement. Let us further suppose that the inscriber continuously inscribes sentences of the form, one equals now, two equals now, three equals now, I mean that's each heartbeat, one, two, three is now, four is now, five is now, six is now, in the proper order, one heartbeat apart, and continually inscribes statements of the form, x, y, z equals here, and then x, y, z prime equals here, where the, sequen where the value of x, y, or z changes in a way illustrated by two, five, nine equals here, step taken in direction z, two, five, ten equals here, these inscriptions, which give expression to the inscriber's awareness of where is here and when is now, are involved in the uniformities of the following kind. The inscriber observes a green object in meeting in front of him. He inscribes, this here now is green, 259 equals here, 4 equals now, and proceeds to inscribe, 259, 4 is green, 
259 equals here, four, uh, 5 equals now. Roughly, he goes from a this here now statement to a statement which is already passed, in which the temporal coordinate is 5 instead of 4, a heartbeat later. Let us suppose that whenever a this here now statement has been thus transformed, the inscriber keeps on inscribing the result at all subsequent moments. Once it gets into his uh, log, so to speak, it keeps getting in there, but the, but the temporal coordinate always gets larger, 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 larger as the heartbeats go on. His inscriptions are cumulative. Another supposition. The inscriber writes his inscriptions in an order that corresponds to an ordering of the names that appear in them according to the value of the numerals of which they are composed. In this case, we can simplify by supposing that his space is only one dimension, so that names have the form space-time coordinate, and that the principle of order is that of inscribing all sentences involving a given value of the time uh, in the order of the values of s. Thus, 9t is green, 10t is blue, and so on. And only after all inscriptions involving that value of t have been inscribed does the inscription continue with inscriptions involving the next heartbeat, so to speak. Thus, 110, 10 is red, uh, 9, 11 is blue, and so on. If we add that the inscriber writes numerals without the use of definitional abbreviations, so that the names, now he's using a coordinate system of names now, uh, and his names will now look like zero prime, 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 zero more primes, zero less primes, and so on. We see that the inscriptions will reflect in their multiplicity, so the map in its, will re reflect in its structure uh, the multiplicities of heartbeats and steps that separate the events which, speaking from without, we know to be referred to by these inscriptions. We have taken into account so far at least some of the uniformities that reflect the conceptual processes involved in the observation and retention of matters of fact. The next thing to take into account is the fact that our inscriber is, we are supposing, in the full sense a rational being. For the rich inner life we have given him, and which is only partially expressed by the inscriptions he make, uh, there is an, a substantial body in it, there is a substantial body of inductive knowledge. And the important thing is that without this inductive knowledge, there can be no rational extension of one's picture of the world beyond what has been observed. In other words, the function of law-like statements is to add to the picture uh, to beyond what you've inscribed. So uh, after he has formed his inductive generalizations, so to speak, he can then enrich his world story uh, beyond what he's actually inscribed. Uh, let us imagine that whenever, whatever the form of the reasoning by which one infers from the occurrence of an observed event of one kind to the occurrence of an unobserved event of another, by means of an inductive generalization, it finds its expression at the inscriptional level in a sequence of two inscriptions, the former of which describes the observed event, while the latter describes the inferred event. And as in the case of observation, let us suppose that once the latter inscription is inscribed, it continues to be inscribed and so on. So we get a cumulative world story. Well, now that is the, the sort of myth, if you will, the sort of fiction which I find helpful personally in understanding the way in which at the core of our language as a representational system, there is this activity of observation, inference, and action. Well, now to conclude or to begin. The two chief topics I've discussed this afternoon relate, each in their own way, to the connection between language and the world. Each topic draws heavily on a certain interpretation of meaning statements. The first uses this interpretation to explain the sense in which, although there are abstract objects, attributes, propositions, relations, etc., there really are no such objects. This was one promissory note. The second theme drew on the theory of meaning statements to support a coherence theory of the semantical functioning of expressions which belong to a representational system. I'm only too well aware that in, fa in part due to the limitations of time, in part to the intrinsic difficulties, not to say complexities, of the subject matter, the presentation has been highly schematic. I'm certain that it has raised at least two questions for everyone, it is answered. But then philosophy was always the task of cutting off the hydra's head. Okay.
we'll have a brief uh, break and then uh, some more questions. Yes. I may have missed it at some point, but I'm not clear about what the answer to the question about indeterminate reference is. Um, the answer to the question about indeterminate reference has not been explicitly stated here. Uh, the answer is, of course, that uh, uh, we need, I'm, I'm going to take what I say to be the, uh, the informal line of the substitutional approach, and then we have the uh, regulative ideal of an adequate, of a language which is adequate to the world. And uh, so that uh, uh, this is a form of the substitutional approach, and it did, in point of fact, you remember, analyze indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. I mean, the, you remember when I discussed the concept of, uh, of uh, indeterminate reference, I pointed out that strategy A2 immediately uh, explicates indeterminate reference in terms of determinate reference. And uh, uh, the commitment I've made throughout the lectures, but which you're quite right, should have been made more explicit, except there's no place to really fit it in, uh, uh, running through the, throughout the lectures was this theme of a commitment to the, the substitutional approach uh, to quantification. Yes? How does one make explicit this idea of an ideal language adequate uh, to the world without making use of indefinite reference? I mean, you'd want to say something like uh, uh, everything gets named. No, excuse me. I mean, you have to be clear about this. Uh, what I said was that the concept of indefinite reference can be explicated in terms of um, definite reference in terms of, sub of, of not of not of a substitution instance in the sense, you know, a formalized system where you have a specified list of substituents. So we explicate the concept. Now we can't, as I said right at the beginning, you can't get away from the use of the concept of the definite reference. There's no way, as it were, of analyzing it out. The only move you can make is to show uh, that uh, in any particular case where you are making an indefinite reference, uh, that indefinite reference can be unpacked as a promissory note reference to definite reference. I mean, there is, to say, uh, to say that the quantificational statement is true is to commit yourself to the truth of a definite referential statement. But that doesn't mean that you have to have the cash for it. So it's only in that sense that the concept of indefinite reference is being explicated. You see, otherwise you'd actually have to come up with the cash. You'd have to be God in order to do it. And that's, of course, uh, uh, none of us is. But, yeah, what, what's bothering me is I don't see what one gains by, uh, by saying that, well, uh, to, uh, to be committed to there exists something, uh, you're, you're, you're committed to having a name to substitute for that X. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not committed to having. And, and saying that you're committed to there being something which... Uh, yeah, I'm not committed to having. No, I'm, at no stage does this involve saying I have in my active vocabulary a name for everything. That would be, I mean, uh, as I said, if one, see, the, the reason, that's the reason I don't like the phrase the substitutional account of quantification, because in, for the formal logician, the concept of substitution involves the notion of a variable and the notion of a uh, recursively specifiable list of substituents, you see. Now, I regard all formal systems as carved out using a background language, which is not a formal system. And it's in that background language that we philosophize. And it's in that background language that we have this intuitive, regulative ideal of a language which would be adequate to the world. It's a regulative ideal in the Kantian sense. But I think, just as for Kant, the regulative ideals get meaning to certain concepts. So I think that this regulative ideal of a language which is adequate to the world is a regulative ideal which, uh, uh, which gives meaning to our uh, to the structure of our general reference. But uh, uh, I don't see any alternative. Uh, and uh, uh, like I said, we can, with 
mean, if we're dealing with formal systems, we can define extensions and we can define a series of extensions and so on. But that's all working within uh, tiny formalized systems which are given, uh, in which you have recursively specified formulae and uh, materials. Yes. I want to talk about the, about the background language in the, uh, the sort of U language in which we draw these distinctions. Yeah, the, it is, putting it crudely, it's the background language in which we have our intuitive mathematics, and in terms of which, you see, we can understand that something is true even though we can't prove it. Yeah, I, I wasn't at all talking about formal languages. I mean, obviously, then, uh, mm -hmm. that analysis of, of, of one condition is, uh, is right and correct. We agree. But then the question is, what, what insight one gains into indefinite reference like, and there exists something such that, uh, by talking about uh, something that happens. By talking about an ideal, ideal norm. Talking, by talking about because an ideal norm. Because I understand yeah. this in the sense of having a name for everything which might count as a something. And it seems to me that the same indefinite reference, uh, you, you know, all of the things. No, but remember, you see, the, the, the point is that uh, somebody who did uh, uh, have an adequate battery of names would, in point of fact, not only be able to make the conceptual point that ex f of x is true if and only if some def definitely referring sentence is true, but he would be able to specify that sentence or to specify a disjunction of it. Uh, so in, for him, there would be no problem even in the practical sense of indefinite reference. For us, there's only, there's just a philosophical problem of understanding the conceptual tie between indefinite reference and definite reference. And I think that's given by this notion of uh, e x f of x is true, if and only if there is a, uh, for some definitely referential expression, the sentence formed from that and uh, the predicate f uh, is uh, true. Now, to say that there is doesn't mean that one has it in one's pocket. And I, that, and I argue then, to say that there is involves this regulative ideal of, uh, of, a, of an adequately known system, of a system which is known ad adequately from within. Now, this is something that, I, that seems uh, philosophically terrifying to me, but that's perhaps because I've lived with it so long. The first paper I published uh, was Realism in the New Way of Words, and that was a central theme of that, uh, of that essay, that this regulative ideal of, a, of an adequate language was what was involved in our theory of quantification. So I've been, I've been arguing for this and living with it for more years than I care, care to mention, and that's probably why it's intuitive, but I do find it clarifying. But then some people don't find Kant's regulative ideals clarifying, and so uh, it, it's, what is clarifying for one person is not necessarily clarifying for another. See, I, in addition, uh, you might say to being a Neo Wittgensteinian and so on, Neo Kantian, Neo Leibnizian. Uh, it's all mixed up together. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, getting back to the, the uh, sort of type structure of uh, higher order predication that we discussed the other day, it seems to me that that's going to be uh, very severely truncated in your reconstruction. Uh, it is true that uh, some second order predications, such as triangularity has the property of being exemplified by A, have translations into first order language. And those are the ones you've concentrated on mm -hmm. your treatment here. But there are lots that don't. And I guess you have to just throw them away, um, including, uh, including quite simple ones like the one that says triangularity is a first order distributed property. Oh, I, I mean, I don't want to get into all the technical, I mean, I've, in, in my paper on abstract entities, I uh, fooled around with that. You see, the, the nice thing about it is that there's a certain sense in which my uh, quantification is, uh, is uh, just second order predicate quantification. I mean, I can reduce all down to second order predicational logic. I see. You do want to keep the whole type structure. That yeah, but the type structure, there's a built-in principle of reducibility, you might say, in my, in my system. Uh, I, I might point out that uh, uh, the kind of approach I take here to, I, to, I discussed triangularity, but I could have made the same point about classes. Uh, membership becomes a, another form of the truth predicate. Uh, uh, so that uh, uh, it falls out, for example, that 
that uh, when we say that Tom is a member of mankind, this comes out as, quote, uh, X is a man is true of Tom. Uh, and so the hierarchy, the hierarchy of uh, membership uh, uh, becomes the hierarchy of truth right away and becomes uh, uh, and now this is uh, the, the application of this to mathematics has been made by a sort of student of a student of mine called Jeff Sika whose book has a book just out called uh, the metaphysics of elementary arithmetic in which he discusses some of these problems but I don't I, I actually don't see that there would be uh, I would be facing a problem with that example but I uh, at the present moment, I'm not going to try to work it out. Yeah. Oh, of course, elementary arithmetic is the one place in which this wouldn't lead to a difficulty because we don't have essentially the quantification. Yeah, uh, but what he what he also does is to compare is to compare uh, the approach that's generated by this with the Russell uh, uh, Whitehead uh, construction and also with the uh, uh, the set theoretical uh, construction. So there is a bit more than. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a good, modest title, which is designed to trap people into, into reading it. But I think that's, uh, I think uh, that's the place as any to, uh, uh, to, to, to say, well, here's the end and here's the beginning.